here, and also we have the law director, Dave Maestros, who's also going to share um, some information that we've been analyzing over the last several weeks in terms of how the city can respond to um, a housing um, proposal like this. Um, there's some different issues that we're dealing with, and he'll be able to share a little bit about that. But so that we can keep this thing moving along, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the ears and let them do their presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Sure. Everybody okay? Okay. Um, as you probably gathered, I'm John, and this is my wife, Terry. Uh, we are here from Akron Center for Recovery, and we're here, I think, for the same reason you guys are. We want to uh, make sure that everybody understands what we're planning to do, and uh, we try to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, did everybody get three by five cards? I mean, if you want cards, we've got more in case they ran out. How about if we just pass them? Sure, on? sure. Hold on. If you didn't get one, start? feel free to Thanks. take part of that. So uh, the, the mayor already stole my thunder as far as explaining what, uh, what my understanding was of the format. So um, we will proceed with our presentation. It's a little bit difficult. I think hopefully some of you guys can turn your heads and see the presentation up there. Um, we'll, we'll try our best to explain what's up there in case you don't have a good view. So we're actually going to share this presentation. Um, I do want to take a minute to thank all of council. I know you guys are really busy and the mayor for coming, as well as all the folks in this room, because I know that you have a lot of things to do out there. So we appreciate you giving us some time. So um, as, as John said, this is John, I'm Terry here. Uh, John's the executive director. I'm the clinical director of Akron Center for Recovery. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that was founded in 2017 in Akron, Ohio. And we're overseen like all other nonprofits by a board of directors. Uh, in case you haven't been to our website, this is up there, but uh, I'll read it for you. The, the mission that we have and that we believe so strongly in, and that's why we're here and, and why we uh, want to do what we're doing. The mission of Akron Center for Recovery is to provide high quality, personalized and evidence-based behavioral health services and recovery housing to individuals who are struggling with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. And Terry will explain a little bit of that. So this is just a little bit of data. I just want to give you a background. Everybody here has heard about the opiate epidemic, so we don't need to talk about that. In fact, most people in this room probably know somebody who's been affected by that epidemic. But this is uh, 2016 data. There's a national survey on drug use and health that's conducted by the federal government. The most recent data is 2016. And as you can see from this graphic, 44.7 million, adult, million adults in the United States had a mental illness in 2016. Uh, let me explain a little bit about the types of mental illnesses this includes. This, this 44.7 million include all types. So we're talking about anxiety, depression, people who have eating disorders, people who have ADHD, uh, people who have obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as uh, more serious mental health disorders. Um, and uh, another, uh, and, and in that survey, they also found that 10.8 million people also were diagnosed with a substance use disorder. So we're talking about um, having an addiction to alcohol or some other substance. In the middle, you see the orange section in there. Those are the people who have what we're calling a co-occurring disorder. Those are the folks, 8.2 million of them in the United States in 2016, that had both a, a substance use disorder and a diagnosed mental illness. So these are, these are the folks that we're looking at. Um, and the folks that will live in the house will, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but we're talking about people who have mild to moderate uh, substance, or um, mild to moderate mental illness. So we're talking about those people with things like anxiety and depression. I know that there was uh, a thread going around that said people with schizophrenia were gonna live in that house. That is not at all the case. Uh, that would not be the appropriate level of care for somebody with that serious of a mental illness. And we'll get into that a little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit later. Do you want to cover that? Sure, sure. Um, 
I want to make sure people understand there are multiple pathways to recovery. In fact, the vast majority of people in the United States get better with no treatment at all. You know, somebody, for example, goes to college and they drink a whole lot and they get a new job and they stop drinking. They might have met the criteria for a substance use disorder, for an alcohol use disorder, but now they don't. So most people get better on their own. However, roughly about 30% of people need treatment. And so that treatment is done on both um, an inpatient and an outpatient basis. So what inpatient means is people actually live at the treatment center. Um, they don't, you know, they, they receive all their treatment there, they eat there, they sleep there. Uh, outpatient treatment is where somebody comes and goes. So they come in, they may spend anywhere from, you know, an hour to three or four hours at the treatment center, and then they leave. Um, medication, and I know this has also come up, medication-assisted treatment, or MAP, has been a lot in the news lately because of the opioid epidemic. It uh, is actually the only evidence-based treatment for people who have problems with opioids. But there are also other kinds of medication. Um, and abuse, some people may have heard of and abuse that's used for um, an alcohol <coughs> problem. That's, that's also included in that. Uh, we have recovery support services, so things like recovery residences, which we're here to talk about today, as well as recovery community centers, even things like yoga and meditation and, and other support wraparound services. And then there are mutual self-help groups, and I think this is what most people think about when they think about people who are in recovery from alcohol or drugs, as they think about AA and NA. There are also a whole other host of, of mutual self-help groups out there, but these are the two most common. So in case you also haven't um, uh, heard of a recovery residence before or a sober home, this is what the law defines as a recovery residence. It's housing for individuals recovering from alcoholism or drug addiction that provides an alcohol and drug-free living environment, peer support, and that's a very important element, assistance with obtaining alcohol and drug addiction services, and other alcoholism and drug addiction recovery assistance. So that's what recovery residences are to the state of Ohio and according to the law. And that's exactly what we plan to provide. Uh, let me talk a little bit about our, what a recovery residence is not. It's not a medical facility. People who live in recovery residences in this type of recovery residence must be able to administer their own medications um, at, with oversight. So we're not talking about somebody keeping a bunch of pills in their room, right? We're talking about them administering them with oversight because it's not a medical facility. It's not a halfway house, and, and I've heard this term mentioned. Halfway houses are actually also defined by the Ohio Revised Code, and they're a place where um, inmates live. It houses inmates who are out on partial release to work, but it's, uh, over, uh, the oversight is by the Ohio Department of Corrections. That is not what we're talking about here. It is not a halfway house. And it's also not a jail because the residents are able to come and go as they please as long as they abide by the residents uh, or the rules of the recovery residents. So we're going to show you a quick video, which my wife can probably explain better than I would ever. Yeah, this, uh, this is a really brief video about what uh, recovery housing is. It was put together by a group called Ohio Recovery Housing, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if Mark would be so kind. Oh, here we go. I first became involved with recovery housing when I worked with a women's program in Central Ohio. And we knew from the very beginning that women with addiction were only going to get well if they didn't need to stay in the environment that was triggering their continued use. We are supportive housing and we serve families who are in recovery from any substance abuse. So heroin, opiate, alcohol, and we're here for the whole family. So there are individual plans for parents who are in recovery, as well as family plans and plans for the children. So our mission is about recovery for the whole family and allowing families to heal and have the resources to become successful on their own. There's a 
growing body of research around recovery housing and it recommends that people do better when they stay longer term in recovery residences, that there be a strong element of peer support because that's really what makes a difference within a residence and also that it be connected to the community in meaningful ways. So uh, being good neighbors, being part of a larger community beyond the residents themselves. There are now standards for recovery housing. There's a national organization, the National Organization of Recovery Residences, and recently we've set up an Ohio affiliation, Ohio Recovery Housing, to set up standards so that we know that there's quality recovery residences throughout the state of Ohio. A safe place where it's not about rent or making money, it's about recovery. And, and that's the mission. And so we come together as peers, we support each other, and, uh, and then we help other agencies who are trying to open up recovery residences with the process, mentoring them, um, and then helping them meet our standards. The great thing about it is that you're surrounded by people who are doing the same thing that you're doing, right? When you have a rough day or when something's going on, you know that you can go and talk to someone that lives next door who's going through the same experience or has been through the same experience. You can kind of walk each other through it so that you're not talking to people from your old life and kind of getting dragged back into it um, when things aren't going the way you want them to. A person looking for recovery housing should expect to find a property that's well maintained a, some privacy within that property, but still a sense of community. They should also expect that their recovery will be talked about and planned for in a very intentional way, but also in a very personal way. But they should also expect that if they do use again, if they relapse, that they'll be connected to services and supports that will help them. There was some significant uh, concern and worry uh, in the community from the standpoint that Again, lack of knowledge and understanding as to what uh, it would promote. I will say that when we first moved in, I was concerned to find out there were five gentlemen living next door that were in recovery housing. Um, I don't, we didn't have an alarm system, we didn't have a big dog, and I, I just didn't know. Um, but after getting to know the guys and getting to know them pretty well after a year and a half, I would say that if you are living next to recovery housing, you've lucked out. They're the best. People would probably say to you, it's not negative, it's a positive thing. And that, uh, that if they think about it, they all have family members that really need something like this. They just made us feel right at home in the neighborhood more than any other neighbors. Eight years ago, we did not have any sober housing. People graduated from our program and went back to the community. And, you know, our success rates were just as good as any other treatment program. But when we added the recovery residences, it shot up from like 37% to 80%. Um, and, you know, we are sort of looking around each other saying, why haven't we been doing this? I don't have to hide that I'm in recovery today. I don't have to hide the situations that I've been in. Recovery housing studies show that people who've lived in recovery housing have better outcomes related to their abstinence from alcohol and drug use, their education and employment opportunities in the community, and also their connection to family and to an overall sense of health and wellness. When you're working on things that are like really deep and personal with you, you need to be able to come rest your head and know that your neighbor's not getting high next to you. I'm thankful that recovery housing exists because I don't know where my life would be without it. So I want to emphasize a few facts about recovery <coughs> residences to get some information out there. Um, Nobody knows exactly how many recovery residences exist in the United States. Um, it's estimated to be in the thousands. Um, they're not currently counted. Uh, the uh, National Alliance for Recovery Residences that they mentioned in the, in the last slide, who's the um, certifying body for recovery residences, has over 2,000 members. There's also a, a, a group of houses called Oxford Homes, um, those also number almost to 3,000. So it, there's a real possibility that we're talking about 
maybe even 10,000 people who live in recovery residences around the United States, you know, 10,000 of those buildings. Yeah. yeah, and as you can see from the slide, and, and I think probably was emphasized in the video a little bit, um, these are all proven by studies that have been done, and if you need citations or, or information about where this, this data is, we'd be happy to provide it. Recovery residences have been shown to decrease substance use, reduce the probability of relapse, reduce the rates of incarceration, and increase the employment opportunities for those in recovery. Finally, and this is maybe more important for everybody in the room, the research indicates that crime does not increase in the areas with well-run recovery residences, and that's what we plan to run. Um, we also wanted to emphasize a little bit about the law, and I think that uh, perhaps this is something that Mr. Maestros might address as well. But people in recovery from alcoholism and past drug use, not current drug use, but past drug use, as well as those diagnosed with a chronic mental, mental illness, are protected from discrimination by the Americans with Disabilities Act. In addition, those individuals who are protected under the ADA are also protected from housing discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. This includes individuals that are currently prescribed with medication-assisted treatment, like we were mentioning earlier. So it is illegal to deny housing, make housing otherwise unavailable, or threaten or intimidate a person exercising their fair housing rights. So this is a community that is a protected class under the law. So some folks have heard about some of our plans, but not all of them. So we thought we'd take a little bit of time to explain what we're, we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at operating a recovery residence at 1890 Edgewood Drive here in Twinsburg, beginning sometime in September. Uh, no more than five adult males will be in the house at any one time. So four residents and one house manager. Uh, there could be, we've had this question about vehicles in the driveway, there could be a maximum of five vehicles parked in the driveway and in the garage on the property. Uh, likely not, and the reason I say that is some of the guys just may not have cars at this point in time. Uh, all of the residents who live in the house will be in recovery, and I think that's really important to emphasize. We are not talking about active users. We are talking about people who are in recovery from alcohol and other substance use disorders and are also diagnosed with a co-occurring mental health disorder. So as I mentioned, we're talking about mild to moderate um, uh, mental illnesses like anxiety and depression. It's important to realize that the people who live in these recovery residences are just like your friends, your family, and your neighbors. They are no different. Um, we also wanted to uh, address a little bit about uh, how we're going to select uh, the people that are going to be living here. They will all be extensively screened by us uh, to ensure that they are appropriate for this level of care under recovery residence standards. Uh, individuals who are convicted of sex crimes, violent crimes, arson will not be accepted at this place. Residents uh, will have anywhere from 30 days to six months or maybe more of sobriety already before they get to this house um, because they're going to be coming usually from a treatment center and sometimes those treatment centers, you know, have them for 90 days or more or they have some sobriety even before they go to the treatment center. So we're talking about people who have, have got a fair amount of sobriety under their belt. Uh, they're not fresh out of detox. They're not fresh out of the, the hospital or anything like that. Um, Residents might stay in the house for a few months or up to two years. We expect an average of about six months to a year is probably the, the best estimate of how long people will stay. It, all, of course, depends upon you know, what, where they stay, you know, where their, their status is. Um, obviously, they're going to be required to adhere to our strict rules, uh, including the prohibition of any kind of substance use. And uh, that will be enforced both by the housing uh, the house manager who will be on site and us and we'll be there uh, on a regular basis. Where can we find those rules? Um, we can provide them for you if you just That'd contact us. Yeah, Make sure, um, put it on your card so that when we take it we remember and if you want to put your uh, name and maybe email <coughs> address, we can email those to you. Might have been something advantageous for 
here tonight. Are they being drug tested every day? Yep, let's go. Every so day? residents, not daily, but residents will be randomly drug screened to ensure abstinence, right? They'll be required to attend counseling, comply with all of the medications that are prescribed by their medical and mental health providers, and attend a minimum of four mutual self-help group meetings per week, as well as attend a mandatory weekly house meeting. They are also required, these aren't guys who are gonna be sitting around the house, uh, they're required to spend a min minimum of 20 hours per week either working, volunteering, or going to school. And they're also expected to do volunteer service in this community. Who is gonna make sure that happens? Can, can, can you hold the questions for the card, please? Because I think it's really important. Sorry, can I? Yeah. I think it's really important for people here to be able to get their questions answered. I'm sorry, which Jerry, is, I didn't, I didn't why? Jerry, well, then they're, 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 coming, they're coming around. Well, but, but because. Okay. All right. Guys, if we yeah. could just let them get the no, conversation. We have questions. Mayor Yates, Ted, Ted questions everybody sat here really questions. nicely and listened to their presentation. That's fine. Now it's time for us to ask questions. And we got they're some questions that we can't get down. Can you be more thorough? They're not done with their presentation. Just let them finish again. But let's just do it. Again. When, when they finish, will there be a question to answer that? There will be. Mayor Yates, they don't want to. Put it next to your house. Because if they're going to leave, yeah, then there's no question there. Put it there. next to your house. Sorry. Wait a minute, guys. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Mayor Yates is trying to give the residents, and I'm a resident, a chance to speak here. I'll help you out. So Terry and John, we're not being disrespectful to you. We're not. Listen, please, just can we just let them finish their presentation? While they're doing there the presentation, we have questions that we'd like to ask. Though I can't write everything down that she's saying. I'm sorry. Look, by the time, hopefully by you the time, you should have made a copy of the presentation and passed it look, out. So hopefully by it. the time, the cards have not ceased. So if you would like another card, that's fine. By the time they're done with the presentation. And the question we have about 30 we have about 30 we have about 30 questions once we get through those if there are additional questions we can try to address those questions once we have it but i'm just you know for everyone here so that we're not disruptive just please i mean they don't have to be here you understand that mayor yates i they think this is a this, conflict this, 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 i would like to address terry i don't have a problem this, with it's that not, it's not a conflict for me what i'm it saying is, a conflict is that for you sir why is it a conflict it is a conflict for you and Why I think if you check yourself, you'll realize. Why was it a conflict? It is a conflict for you. We will talk. Yeah. But let's start with so anyway, you tell us where please. you're really from, not please. from Akron. Cleveland please. attorney. Hey, please. And he please. was your name. Let's go. Let's open it up. Let's start with the truth. Tell the yeah, truth. Let's go where they live now. Let's talk about you. Why did they put this behind the city hall? Please, please just let them finish. We'll try to address some questions. Akron Center for Recovery agreed to do this residence to, or this meeting to provide education to residents. There are a lot of residents out there that have questions. I understand that there are residents here who also want to be heard. The mayor's going to provide an opportunity for that after all the questions are addressed. And Akron Center for Recovery has volunteered to meet with two or three representatives from the community to address community concerns no, face to face. So I understand that, but again, I agreed to, and my husband agreed to do this public meeting by using the card so we could get questions Terry, answered. I am not if you don't appreciate that, or if you can't abide by that, we will leave. And he, and he, and he played chicken with a semi and died. So I'm on both sides of this, and I totally get what you're saying. We've got some slides that we'd like to finish with. Uh, if you haven't gotten a three by five card or a card to write, I'm not going to put my it, questions on a card. I'm going to ask them because you finish your presentation and then I'm still going to ask my questions because I'm well, telling you. No, you're not because we're we're just going to answer the cards. Because this is how you're going to support us from Copley. We have questions. No, we're not. Is not a response. This is an open public forum of citizens. And when you have a point to make, you yeah, make it, then we make it. But this is not this is right. you, I only Look, take questions Look. based on my way of doing right. it. Let's That's work. nuts. This Let's is work. not a Well, then I think our, our city officials over there better remember that the next election is like. Yes, go ahead and finish your presentation. Let's go ahead. We want to hear more. Just for your the machine. You guys understand that they're going to walk out and some of us who have come to hear their presentation are also not going to be able to hear their presentation. So as a resident, I would appreciate if you didn't ask questions and followed the rules that, that were asked. I didn't need to be private. I'm not asking to be private. 
I'm asking you this to respect This is America. America. The rules are America. ask questions and have an open adult let dialogue. Them, let them finish their presentation. You're saying don't ask questions. Okay. No, I'm saying let them finish their presentation. I've taught school for 34 I years, sir. The, the best way to learn is to have questions and a dialogue. I understand that. Let presentation. But would you let, let a student finish. interrupt you? Yeah. Thank you. Let them let them speak. Okay. Let them finish. I'm going to finish you with keep this slide. We want to also explain a little bit about the, the process that we're going to use to secure their medications. They will be secured on property so that we can um, make sure that nobody has access to anybody's other, uh, any other person's medications. They will be locked under safes. Uh, they will be controlled by the house manager. Um, and as I said, each individual will have a separate safe that they will have, only they will have the combination to, so they will be controlled very strongly. Um, their rooms and belongings are subject to random searches. They'll agree to that before they come to the house. Uh, the medications are going to be randomly counted to make sure that they're taking them appropriately, taking them as prescribed. Uh, they will be required to sign releases of information so that we can have contact with their mental health providers or medical providers. Uh, so we will be on top of what their, their medical situation is. And we also brought with us somebody who's also sacrificed his time uh, because we thought that it might be appropriate for you to hear something about what the day in the life of someone in a recovery house is like. And I'm just asking you to please be polite to the gentleman who's also volunteered his time. Uh, and we, he didn't have any obligation to come. He just came because he's a, a good guy. And he wanted to explain just shortly what his day is like or was in a recovery house. Ryan? How you doing? My name's Ryan Wilson. Um, so um, I went to treatment last year after 22 years of use. Um, I, I cannot stress enough how, cru how critical and conducive the recovery house and I was placed in after treatment was to me. You know, um, research will show that it takes, on average, 21 to 30 days to break an old habit. It's anywhere from 66 days or more, on average, to create new ones. The stability and the structure and the accountability that I received at this transitional recovery housing was critical and very, very important to my recovery. Um, it helped me rebuild my relationships. It helped me just rebuild my life and just, it built my work ethic. It, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, I don't okay. know, I speak in public very there. often. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, I know what the stigma is. You know, a lot of people say that we're worthless, we're hopeless, and we're not worthy of a second chance. And I cannot stress enough that we do recover. And without recovery housing, I know myself would not have been able to recover. I am now 14 months sober. I'm, li I'm working at an addiction center. <laughs> I'm working at an addiction center now and helping fight the battle of addiction on a daily basis. I am just one of a vast number of people that have recovered and went on to do very important things. Um, so just thank you for your time. Can you back up to the last slide sure, for sure, a second? Because sure. I, I, I don't want to make Brian stand up here anymore to talk about what, what it's like inside a recovery residence. These are people who work. They get up in the morning, they get ready for work, they eat breakfast, Oops. they go to work, they, you know, they, they work most often during the day, most often during the day, frankly. And then they may attend counseling appointments, doctor's appointments, something in the afternoon. They return in the evening for dinner. And then um, they go to meetings at night. When they come back from meetings, it's fairly late. They may talk to each other in the house, watching TV, do some recovery work, and then they go to bed and they get up and do it all over again, which is pretty much like everybody in this room. So uh, obviously you probably have access to our information. If not, it's, it's in here. If you want a copy of this presentation, I would be happy to email it to you. Uh, just you know, on those cards, just Give me your email address and I will send you a whole copy of this. Uh, we're happy to provide the house rules as was requested here. 
Um, again, we'll, we'll be happy to provide that information and hopefully we can answer your questions um, that you provided on those cards. So. Danielle Gray from Ohio Recovery Housing, if you can put that back real quick. Uh, Danielle Gray from Ohio Recovery Housing also volunteered to take questions. So if anybody has any questions, uh, they can give her a call or send her an email. Um, I think you said our business cards are on the back. They have our email addresses too. So if you want to email instead of call, please feel free. Are you serious fine with your credentials? Your credentials, your educational background, and your. No. Uh, your no, but we can talk about that. Make sure you put it down with cards. Sure. Sure. So I guess we'll, uh, I don't know if Mayor, <coughs> Mayor or Mr. Scafidi is going to do this. Does, uh, let me ask first, um, where are the cards that we passed around? There were over 200 cards in that. They never got over. Um, yeah, can, can we like, get them over there? Same. It's not the does, any, does anybody need a card? Does anybody need a card? I have too many questions to write Okay. Um, first and foremost, I, I want to thank all the residents here that are from Ward 1 and, and all the residents that are from any ward that you live in or what part of the city. You know, uh, a week ago when I learned about this and, and sat down, I sat down with Mayor Yates and we discussed um, after that it's been a flurry of, of, of things going out on uh, social media. Some of it, some of it were true and some of it not so much. And that's the part that we wanted to make sure that everybody knew. I understand where most people, and I'll be honest with you, most of the, most of the calls I received in the communication are not for this, okay? But I've had some that are, uh, they are for this. And some have been in treatment themselves. And they're very, very uh, uh, glad to see something like this come. What we wanted to do when I talked to Mary Yates is just be able to get everybody in one room at one time and whether you, uh, it, it, it calms your nerves down or not, but at least everybody is going to hear the same message and just to dispel some of the things out there on social media that are not true, okay? So you may hear some things again tonight and I've heard people tell me, well, I already heard that already. Well, okay, but I, I met with the hers and I've met with the mayor and I've met with the law director. I've met with just about everybody that I can in order to, to teach myself because when this first it came out, I, I didn't know that much about it. I've learned more about recovery. I've learned more about our ordinances with, with regards to this, our codes. So um, it, it was a learning uh, curve for me and hopefully it'll help some of you and maybe dispel some of the rumors. And again, at the end of the night, you still may not like it or you, it may help you, but I'm just gonna throw out the questions. Pardon me? When did you first hear about it? Last Tuesday. And I'm why speaking for me. All, why weren't we all voted on this before you voted on it? I didn't why vote. Well, the here, to vote for us? okay, let me get to the questions. Okay. But, and that's one of the rumors, and seeing as you threw that out there, I did not vote on it. Oops. Council's been on summer recess. This never I'm came, this never on. came to this council. more important than a recess. This came, never came to council for a vote because it wasn't necessary. Okay, I'm going to stick to the, I'm going to stick to the agenda. Excuse me, young man. All right. Who's paying? Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. You're an unruly child in my classroom. It needs to be shut up. Raise your hands. Okay. We should have never gotten this part to start with. That's right. Who is paying for ambulance service and protection and health? Our taxes. <laughs> I don't know. Who's going to pay? Yeah. Yeah. The people that live here. And uh, whoever yelled out your taxes is partly correct. Some of these people may be on Medicaid or Medicare. 
Um, most often they will be, excuse me. Which is still our taxes. Excuse me. Most often they will be working and some of them may even have their own private insurance. Okay. Yeah. But what about our police and our fire that's going to go up when they have to attend the house? Okay. Can you hear me here? Can you that a little bit better? Yeah. Okay. Next uh, couple are just comments. They were not questions. And uh, somebody wrote, no sober home, period. That's all they wrote. The next one is, uh, quit treating Glenwood Acres like, I'm not going to say what they wrote, but. No. Poop. All right, poop. But they didn't use that word. Okay. Mayor and council members. The next question. It has been brought up that the owners aren't, uh, haven't been able to keep good renters. What makes, it, what makes it think that you feel this is the best option as opposed to doing the work involved and find the renters uh, that can go in to your property? Um. The last experience that we had with the renter was not that good. Um, unfortunately, we had to evict him because he wasn't paying rent. Um, it was at that point that we felt that this was an opportunity for us to do what we have been wanting to do for a long time, which is to run a, a sober home. This has not been, you know, we, we didn't just dream this up last month or something. This, this was something that we've been considering. Uh, the, the company started in 2017. She and I have been talking about this for years. Uh, that we wanted to start something like this. This just happened to be an opportunity because the, the, the tenant left, or we evicted him early, um, and it, there was an opening, so we figured this was a property that we owned, and we figured this was the, the best use for it, and we wanted to pursue what we feel is a very strong mission on our part um, and, and use our property for that mission. Okay. Did, did you increase your insurance and why? Um, the the uh, nonprofit organization itself will have insurance uh, for this home, and so that's a completely different situation than us in, insuring the home. It's uh, the, the 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 nonprofit entity will, uh, as the renter of the house, will carry the insurance. Um, so that the we, we will carry insurance as well, but there will be a, a, a double layer of insurance. We've it, not increased any. Uh, it, Can the question? We've not increased any. There are two different policies now. There was only one. It's either yes or no. Did you increase it? No. Okay. Uh, no. Yes. Yes. Why? Because one is by the nonprofit organization and one is by us personally. So there's two I layers think, of insurance. I think. The the business is carrying a different layer of insurance. It's completely different. It applies to a nonprofit organization. It's different than a personal. Okay. Here's the, here's the next question, and it might help you out. Okay. Is your lender aware you are conducting business out of your home in Copley and Twinsburg? Um, yes. <laughs> when was the first communication with Mayor Yates about this recovery home? Truthful. Yeah, I'm, we're not here to lie. Last week? Yeah. I don't, I don't know exactly. Last week? I believe. I believe we met on Tuesday morning here at City Hall. Yeah, Is I can answer right? that question. I mean, they've inquired, um, it was several weeks ago, they inquired to our building department regarding, uh, regarding opening up this house. Um, and so since then, again, as I've told and any resident that's called me, um, we've been investigating, looking at different ways of doing different things. Uh, in terms of our rights as a city, looking at it in relation to our ordinances, looking at it in relation to state law and to federal law. So, um, yeah, so their questions came. They didn't need a permit. There's no permit for this. There's no permitting process for this. So I think well, that's well, where everyone's going to do that. Okay. Well, one is you dwelling into a different occupancy. How is that not part of the administrative code of Ohio? 
Sam, yeah. Please write your questions down, please. Then at the at the end we will we will let everybody talk. At the end when they're when at the end when they're done, Kathy, if you wait a second, when they, when they're done, when they're done, we'll answer any questions you guys want to have for us. We're all staying we're all staying here. You just said several weeks. So So you've known for several weeks and you failed to roll out a plan to the community? Has your mortgage company received notice of your plans with the property? That's the same question, the same answer, yes. Did you know there was a school on both ends and a ball court in the middle? You're not allowed to have drugs near a school. Did you know that? Our patients <coughs> are working their butts off trying to keep this country clean because it's town clean. Can you, and you bring please, it please. Is, is the IRS aware you are taking residency deduction at both homes? Uh, the IRS has whatever it says on my tax returns. What, I'm sorry, what was that answer? The IRS is aware of whatever's on my tax returns, so, so yeah. Your tax return, taking taxes I, I don't know right off the top of my hand. You obviously know. Are you going to apply on that? We operated a rental property, which was properly recorded on our taxes, and that's that. Why don't you speak up and let the residents know it's embarrassing. Thank you. Okay. How have you prepared the home uh, to date for residents? We, we haven't. We're, we're, in, we're in the process you, of it. Right. Are you going to? Sure. Sure. Our first work date is Sunday. If it, anybody wants to help us volunteer. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what happens to evicted residents? Uh, depends on their level of care, but generally the, uh, if they've been evicted or if they're being kicked out of the house, then they're probably going to be going to a higher level of care. Well, you said that your own words, John, that you and Terry wanted to be very involved from Copley. So I'm assuming that Go ahead, Mr. Be there day to day and come and take these residents if they do fail their We'll get that answer. To their next place. We will get that answer. No, I think we should answer. Will will the money uh, will the money profited from this by the homeowners go towards the sober program, towards the house uh, with upkeep, or just to the homeowners? This is a nonprofit, so any of the money will go back into the nonprofit. Which is as 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 the yes. Excuse me. Excuse me. As the. We'd be happy to give you an application. Okay, yay. Um, as, as, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. As the owner of 1890 Edgewood Drive, we will not individually be making a profit off of this residence. Okay, okay, okay. Financial responsibility for any problems caused. I, um, that's what it says. I, I would assume who has the financial responsibility for any problems caused? Probably to be covered by insurance. Your insurance. It depends on, on what the situation is. I'm not sure what you mean by problem. It, look, if you don't like our answers, I'm sorry. We're going to provide the best answers we can to any of your individual questions. If you don't like them and you want to disagree with us, I, I understand. We're not here to disagree with you. I don't really think you do understand because there is actually. We're going to follow the questions that Mr. Scafidi asks. And you don't even want to hear those solutions. I'm just following the protocol that we've agreed to. Here, John. Go ahead, Mr. Let me finish. Okay. Is a halfway house drug or alcohol facility? A halfway house? I'm sorry? Yeah, that's what it says. Is a halfway house drug or alcohol facility? Um, I, I, there's probably a little bit of a com, um, confusion in, term, in terminology here. A halfway house is a house that is uh, related to the prison system that has actual inmates living in it. That's not what a recovery residence is. A recovery residence is a house that has people who are in recovery living in it. Okay. Is is this court mandated rehab? So are they mandated by a court to attend or to be in, in a sober house? 
Not, not usually. Usually it's a voluntary basis. Okay. So there's no court that tells them they have to be there. Um, what is the Akron Center uh, recovery's responsibility in maintaining the residents' uh, sobriety? Does the Akron Center, I, I would assume, have any responsibility to this? The, the responsibility for anyone's sobriety lies in that person. The Akron Center for Recovery is not responsible for somebody's sobriety or for their recovery. I mean, we certainly are providing an environment that we think is most conducive for people's recovery. Uh, but every individual who is in recovery is responsible for that recovery. Okay. And what happens if they fall off the wagon? Do you want to take that? If, uh, if they happen to slip while they're living in the recovery residence, there's, there's a couple of answers. Uh, it depends on whether or not we find drugs on the property, right? Because if we find what? drugs on, excuse me, may I finish? If somebody brings drugs or alcohol on the property, they're going to be immediately evicted. If they bring illicit substances on the property, we're calling the police department. Just, just a minute. Let me, please let me Better. finish. Let me, please let me finish. Let me answer the question. Um, individuals who have slipped but are open and honest with the fact that they've had an issue will be referred to a higher level of recovery, which means they will receive more intensive treatment services and they will be required to leave the house for a period of seven days until they can show that they are in compliance with our rules, which is um, no alcohols or drugs in their system. Okay. I think, I think this question is going to be for Mr. Maestros. Um, what law provides for this in our charter? None. <laughs> what is it? None? Okay. He's, Mr. Maestros is going to give a, a short presentation, so I will put this question for him. Mr. Law Director would like to read that while you're asking questions so he can get educated. Yeah, I think that All right. <coughs> There's two more questions on this sheet. Um, use the house behind here. I'm assuming it's the house that's, that's back there. And use the house behind City Hall. Well, go ahead, because you were so passionate about this, why can't we? And, and this is why. So the purpose of a recovery residence is to act as a bridge between treatment and individuals living on their own in the community. Recovery residences are located in residential neighborhoods. The property by, behind here is not located in a residential neighborhood, and therefore it wouldn't be appropriate. Okay. What about those children that were right the, Hello. Really? Please. Okay. There's a vacant. There's a vacant Cleveland. Okay, vacant Cleveland Clinic building by, by Enterprise or Case, which yeah. is off of 91. Okay, uh, need in kind services from Cleveland Clinic. I believe that's just a statement somebody's making. Okay, will the residents of the recovery home have freedom to leave at their will? To be clear, will there be control over their physic physical location at all times? Uh, like we said in the presentation, it's not a jail. They can come and go as they please as long as they're following the rules. So they can possibly go out and get drugs and bring right. back into our areas? Yes. yes. Okay, I've got one more from, I believe, the same president. How was the home on Edgewood Drive in Twinsburg selected for the site of this recovery home? Yeah, I, I think we already covered this, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's a house that we own. It's... Uh, uh, like I said, we had had a, a, an unpleasant experience with this tenant. When the tenant vacated, this was an opportunity for us to follow what we feel is in our hearts the best use of this property. Then sell it back to us residents. Let the real estate sell it. Sell it back to us for buying from you. Okay. The next question is for Mr. Maestro, so I'm going to put that one aside. Yeah, why don't you just sell it? Yeah. 
he will um can you please stop can you please stop center screaming for recovery look, can open look, this in could, there are people here that would like to hear the, the answers to these questions there are people okay so please let's get through this we'll let you guys voice your concerns and, and ask any questions of, of administration here anything you want just, just please no scream out here and let them finish and, and Sam get through this it's you know it's, it's got to be frustrating for those that are really sitting here wanting to learn some of the answers to these questions you know with everyone just wording out stuff so please could you stop doing that Sam would you give the lady in the the lady in the back has her hand up. would you give her a card the lady in the back okay how is the owner of the home paid by each tenant is it by insurance companies uh, generally this is not covered by insurance um, so the residents will be paying the uh, Akron Center for Recovery on a weekly basis. Okay. I think this one's repetitive, but what happens if the client reverts back to dependency? Yeah. Then they're yeah, taken we, out. Yeah, we already covered that. Correct? They're yeah. taken out of there. Will the occupants in the home be working or staying at home all day? So I think um, um, we answered that in the presentation, but to make it really clear, People who are living in this residence are required to do one of the following three things. They're required to either work a minimum of 20 hours a week, they're required to volunteer a minimum of 20 hours a week, or they're required to be in school a minimum of 20 hours a week so that you're not sitting around at home. Okay. Uh, will there be a live-in counselor in the homes at all times? the house manager will be in the house um, he is also in recovery um, but it's not clear whether he will be a counselor or not but he will be a house manager okay. uh, this is this is can i can go i ahead. expand sorry um, so if you go online and you do a little more research you'll find this is what's called a level two recovery house or recovery residence and uh, level two recovery residences are overseen by a house manager. It's not treatment. So there is no treatment provided on property. Okay. How often will, uh, how often will the new people, how often will there be new people going in there to live? Okay. Um, the general length of stay is somewhere we anticipate it's going to be somewhere between six to twelve months but it could be up to two years that people will be staying there okay. who will maintain the home inside and out that uh, will be one of the requirements of the residents that they maintain the house uh, we we hope that we maintain the house uh, to be the best on the prop uh, on the block and uh, that's going to be their requirement <laughs> okay this is for you um, how often will you be at the house to ensure uh, proper maintenance and activities are taking place? At, at least once a week. Okay. Are visitors allowed and who can visit? Visitors are allowed, uh, but they um, have to leave by 10 p.m. They have to leave, leave by 10 p.m. And uh, visitors are also required to follow the same exact rules as the residents on the property. They're not allowed to bring alcohol or illicit substances onto the property. Okay. And, and that, by the way, if you're invited to visit, you may visit. Okay. This location is typically kept private for these homes. However, the whole city knows the address. How do you plan to keep unwanted visitors away? Unwanted visitors, is that what it said? Yeah, I, I mean, I hope that uh, if, there are, if there are problematic people there that, uh, I mean, th these are five guys that are going to be there, and if they don't want the people there, then, then they're not going to be there. They're going to be thrown out. It's right? hard to hear you, John. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. speak closer to the mic. Uh, if there's a, if there's an unwanted visitor, then uh, usually the people at the property will take care of that. I mean, this this is a, a group of people who want the same thing. They want peace and quiet. They want to work on their sobriety. They want to work on their recovery together. If there's somebody there that is problematic, it's almost guaranteed that these folks will will self police, and the folks at the home will make sure that anybody who is an undue influence or somebody who's not a good influence will not stay at that property okay 
Um, charity, where are your financials? We don't have any financials yet. We, we've, we've, all, we've got financial plans, we've got a business plan, we've got uh, a strategic plan, but you know, we, we've just started. So we, we have a, essentially a, a $1,000 in the bank account that was the, as a result of somebody contributing uh, to us, and uh, that's it. We don't have financials. Is that public record? The donation? The, uh, yes. Um, uh, for nonprofit organizations, in order to stay as nonprofit, are open to the public. So if somebody would like to see a copy of our business plan or strategic plan, we can make sure that you have a copy here at City Hall, so if that would be helpful. Um, for 501c3s, there is there requirement filings that are public record? You can look up any 501c3 on, on the internet and pull up their financials that have to be provided on a, on a yearly basis. So um, once operations start, I assume they would be following that same law. Yes. Okay. It's called a Form 990, and it's something that is filed once a year by all nonprofits. Ours isn't due until November, so the first one will be filed in November. How are you experienced with mental or drugs? Your med medical certificate. Question. Recovery residences are not operated by medical professionals. My credentials, to answer the question that came up earlier, is I'm a licensed professional counselor, and I have worked with people who um, are in recovery, people who are undergoing treatment, um, and I've worked with people who are, or who have co-occurring disorders also called duly diagnosed. So my background is in counseling. Why is your charity out of your home in Copley? Um, all we do is uh, paperwork, so there's really not a location necessary for us to, to have uh, the, the work of the nonprofit is essentially a, a board meeting here and there. Which um, never occurs at the house. It never occurs at the house. So uh, the only thing that occurs at the house is my, my filing. Okay. And how are you conducting background checks? Uh, that's yet to be determined. However, we would be happy to work with the Twinsburg Police Department on that. Okay. Typically, um, uh, let me, can I, can I, typically background checks are not conducted for residences, or residents in recovery house. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Residents will... That's the next question. Thank you. Uh, residents will be randomly drug screened. How often and by what procedure? We're anticipating the use of urine drug screening cups, which provide instant results. Uh, we're also making available a laboratory to be able to confirm those results. Residents will be randomly tested. I would, I would anticipate that each resident will be randomly <coughs> tested at least twice a month, and I'm saying at least twice a month, maybe more. Well, that's $1,000 a month. It's about $100 a drug test. Okay. Five people, that's $500. You only have $1,000. So. You mentioned house meetings. Who will bring in and run the house meetings? Um, I intend to run the house meetings, um, but the house manager is going to participate, obviously. So uh, it's it's going to be either Terry or me or both of us and the house manager. Okay. Um, have you reached out to the local AA community to sur uh, to surround the home and allow them to help these men? Have you taken any outside help from the, the local AA and surrounding area or asked for any? Um, I participate in those meetings uh, and I'm part of that community, but uh, we haven't done any kind of uh, request for assistance, if that was the question. So you haven't outreached to any local AA organizations or anything like that to help out? Can I? Let me, I, I, think, I think maybe part of the problem is a misunderstanding of AA. So AA does not ever get involved in any outside organizations or um, any kind of political things. Um, it's, it's one of the things that's in their 12 traditions. Okay. Who is the board of directors? Names and professions. 
So uh, my name is Terry here. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, we have Carolyn Kleeman on the board who's a licensed nurse. Um, and, uh, I'm a lawyer. Um, my name is John here. Uh, we also have a gentleman by the name of John Rolfe on the board. Um, he um, uh, works at Fieldstone Farms. He's a general manager of that farm. And okay. he's uh, also had um, experience in working with people who have mental illnesses and, and finding them employment. Okay. Um, how is Akron Recovery trending with successes and other failures? This is other our, houses, you this, know. This is our first uh, recovery residence, so we don't we don't have any record. Okay. It has been my experience that successful addict alcoholics attend regular AA uh, meetings. Will you be providing transportation for these men to attend meetings during the day, the evening, and have requirements for weekly meetings? Uh, well, as we said, uh, at, at least four weekly meetings of some support group, whether it's AA, NA, Smart Recovery, uh, there's a lot of different uh, organizations that are, are uh, appropriate for this population. So we'll require at least four meetings a week. Uh, we will not be providing their transportation, but uh, we don't anticipate, I mean, generally those groups will, uh, um, they'll, they'll pick up people that need rides and they'll, they'll find rides. But they don't know about it, but they'll pick up. Thank you. <laughs> okay, is there a policy in place for failure, I think this is a repeat, for failure to adhere to rules and to have clean drug testing? Yes, there are policies in place for that. Okay. Um, it has been my experience that methadone and or sub, uh, suboxone, suboxone correct, <laughs> does not... Uh, something uh, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, are these men off such drugs Do, it doesn't say they don't they didn't put their name down and if it's going to prevent them from uh is it one of those uh blockers exactly whoever said that thank you oh if if the question has to do with medication uh, assisted treatment which involves suboxone um Vivitrol, uh, um, methadone, some of those uh, medications. We will accept um, people who are in recovery who are prescribed medication-assisted treatment. So if they are prescribed by a doctor to have Suboxone, then yes, they would be permitted on the, to, to use Suboxone. Okay. And we will be doing uh, uh, routine random drug checks to make sure that they're not overtaking their medication. Will the house manager have access to Narcan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Are you certified by the National Alliance for Recovery Residences? We will be. Uh, actually, the state affiliate is Ohio Recovery Housing, but until we get operational, uh, they can't start their certification process, but that will happen. Do you have an anticipated date? Okay. <laughs> Why don't you want to do this in a house behind City Hall in the property zone district as offered by our council reps? Um, and I appreciate the fact that, that people would prefer to see the recovery residents there. However, um, as I previously explained, recovery residences are located in residential neighborhoods for a reason. It's help. It's it's the, it's they they are. I you know perhaps you guys can address the zoning issue after we're done. And that will be addressed this evening. Over over it will definitely be addressed. How do you justify reduction of probability of relapse for an alcohol an alcoholic when three bars and a beverage store within walking distance from your home? <laughs> Each person, each person in recovery is responsible for their sobriety. They are going to be uh, confronted with uh, advertisements for alcohol, uh, alcohol uh, on the street, uh, alcohol everywhere. Um, they are going to have to learn how to deal with that. 
And that's part of the transition between a treatment center being, being protected inpatient in, in a treatment center and living on their own. And that's why this is a, an important phase in anyone's recovery. They'll be able to experience that and be able to be in a supportive network where they've got people that they live with that they can talk to about this kind of thing in addition to their normal networking with their uh, support groups or whatever they belong to they will have that network of four guys or five guys that they can talk to about those kinds of issues and that's exactly why this is an appropriate place for those folks okay I think this repeat, why was this, how, this location picked and how, and I think we, we already know that. I believe everybody knows that. That's been talked about several times. Um, have or has there been any analysis to disseminate police interaction did not rise after a residence was established? Uh, research has shown that crime does not increase in areas of well-run recovery residences. Well, well, you mean for How can statistics claim no more crime around recovery homes when um, after a Google search in recovery home locations, majority are in crime areas? Also, many are not even registered. There was an extensive study done of Oxford homes that uh, demonstrated that there was no increase in crime in that area. We'd be happy to forward that to you if you'd like a copy of that. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Okay. Um, was Ryan part of your program? Have you ever uh, run a sober home? Uh, we already answered that. Uh, no, we've never run one before. And Ryan was or was not a part of your? I, we don't currently uh, have you a didn't recovery do resident, so he couldn't have been part couldn't of have been part of yours. Okay. Um, what is the failure rate? Five male residents, uh, Max, what about their fa any families? Five male residents max, what about their families and how many changes are there to be given before, how many chances are to be given before they are asked to leave? So I, I think some of that was addressed as well already. What's the failure rate? Do you have any idea? Um, if, you, if you noticed on the video that we played, the gentleman who was speaking on there, uh, it, he runs um, uh, recovery treatment and an extensive network of recovery housing in the Columbus area and he noted that it went from about a 37 percent success rate to an 80 percent success rate for their treatment center once they open up the recovery housing and people went there following treatment. Okay. What are the edu educational and exper experimental experience credentials of you, John and Terry, and the house managers? So what are your credentials for the three of you? Okay. Uh, please provide. Yeah, the, the house manager may or may not be a certified peer recovery supporter, which is a certificate obtained through the state of Ohio. If they're not, we will certainly encourage them to do so. Okay. okay. Here we go. Yeah, well, again, how was 1890 selected? I think we know that. Um, how is the house manager determined? Did you go over that? Do you want me to take it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so we're being super, super picky about a house manager, which is why I can't give you an official open date for the house. Um, we're hoping September 1st, but uh, the house manager is going to have to be somebody who's super solid in their recovery. It's going to have to be somebody who's calm enough to be, to be able to deal with some folks in the community who aren't very happy. And they're going to have to be somebody who's really interested in helping other people in their recovery. They will be, um, we have a 14-page application that requires um, references, it requires um, information from doctors, from counselors. So they'll be required to fill the same, out the same application as all of the other residents. Okay. Okay. 
what, what, I, what? what I said to you was that uh, they they would have a break on their rent. That's all. Uh, we have we have not currently hired a house manager. We're currently looking for one. Okay. Okay. We'll answer that. We will. Um, I'm all for helping people in recovery, but would feel more comfortable it being separated from Glenwood Acres. They're making a statement. Okay. That's not a question. Um, you stress uh, with no citations and safety to the community, but I am here to learn how it does work. What's the process? I think we've gone over that. Uh, yeah, I believe so too. What is the process of people coming and going through the house? I think we've answered that too as far as they'll be uh, anywhere from six months to two years and oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I believe that's okay and you've answered that the house managers qualifications I believe you guys answered that okay you haven't been able to you haven't been able to maintain uh, your residence as a homeowner yet alone for a recovery home how can you represent and maintain the resident's home when you live 40 plus miles away We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, is the manager in recovery? We know that he is. Okay. Uh, who polices the rules? I believe we, we already answered that. The video said privacy is important for recovery. Uh, where do five adult men find privacy in a three bedroom, one bath house? Ryan can probably talk about this too, but, but my experience in, in a recovery home is that the guys work it out. I mean, it's, it's no different than uh, having four brothers in you know, a two bedroom house. I mean, people work it out, it's a family. Okay, uh, Terry, sell your house and use the money to put this into a more appropriate um, place or area, you can also put these people in your house. Akron, Cleveland uh, would do better. This is not a correct location. So they were making their statement. Um, third party. Uh, who are they to conform? Who places that or do you for a test? We answered the drug test problem. This is about drug testing, okay? Who's diagnosing these patients and how long after initial diagnosis are they put into the recovery home? Which treatment uh, in, in which treatment center? Um, diagnoses will come from uh, the resident's physician, perhaps the resident's counselor, uh, the resident's psychiatrist. Um, these, will, these will come in with them as part of the uh, application process that they have to complete. Okay. We'll just take a couple more questions because I think, you know, everybody's getting tired here. I okay. Um, no, we're not. We're not tired. We live here. We don't live in Copley. We're not tired. Uh, do you think it's, well, I, uh, the, I guess this is a statement. Do you think it's fair for the neighbors on losing value of this house being opened in a residential neighborhood? And uh, I, I guess that's for more of the administration sure. than anybody. Did you know Mayor Ray Yates prior to this issue? And how? No. No, we've never we met him. Know Mayor Yates prior to this. No, there was a different mayor when we lived here. But did you know him from your neighborhood? No. Thank you. What about Boy Scouts? Okay. Uh, NAR uh, requires 50 square feet per resident per bedroom. Do you comply at this residence? Um, 
we'll meet all the NARA requirements. Uh, Ohio Recovery Housing is the state affiliate. They'll be coming to inspect the house at some point after we get the get it ready for them. And uh, if we don't comply, then we'll figure out a way to uh, alleviate those concerns. Does that happen before you open? Is that a 38 foot house or a 40? I'm not sure. Is the house habitable right now? No. It's not. Okay. When was the last time you cut the grass? Uh, we had somebody cut the grass, I think, last week, twice. The whole year? The whole year? The pictures in the bulletin don't look like it was cut last week. Okay, let me see. A couple more. I'm trying to get through that because there's some a lot of repeats here. Yeah, there's repeats. Um, Mr. Maestro's having. Okay, Mr. Maestro's. That's going to be for him. Um, well, let's see. These are all repeats. Will our property value go down? I guess maybe Mr. Yeah. Fidge could answer yeah. that. Definitely. They said, why is your charity still in pending status with no financials? Anybody answer the property value? Answered that? Okay. It's not pending status anyway. All right, that's a repeat. Yeah, we're getting to a lot of repeats now. What kind of volunteer work, work will they be doing? What are some examples? Um, some examples are if, uh, if the property owner is willing, our guys might shovel their, drive, or their uh, sidewalk or driveway in the winter. They may rake leaves. Um, we intend on contacting City Hall to see what kind of other opportunities there are for volunteering in this community. So all of their volunteer hours will be here? Why do you do this? Do you have a backstory? If you want to get a hold of me, I'll tell you. That's a long story. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how are you bringing complaint? There's a lot of repeats. Why don't we do two they're all, I would read them all. Yeah, they're repeat. You're welcome to look at them afterwards, but they're repeats. Okay. Okay, two more. Let's make it good. We're almost at the bottom here. Here's a good one. Will there be surveillance inside and outside the home? Um, it's something that we're considering, and it's more than likely that there will be surveillance outside the house. Outside the home. Outside the house. Okay. And uh, just for the home's protection, or what will that surveillance? Yeah, for, for the home's protection. Okay. Uh, do you really think you? Uh, do you think you'll be able to open in a month? And I think you said we hope so. sometime in September. Oh, what date did you meet with Russ Rodick and Larry Finch? It would be in the city records, so if you want to, you know, get confirmed. If, if you let me finish. I could address that when you're done. Yeah, I, I, I know that it's, answer, it's, too. It's in the public it's records, and I mean, it's in my calendar, but. But did she write it down on a card? Okay. All right, let me get a real good one. Okay, I've heard this a lot, and uh, here's the, uh, is this a way for you to make money because you owe too much money on the home? Yes. 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 Well, if you guys want to answer our questions, then that makes our job a lot easier. Yeah. I mean, if you want to, you know, come up with answers for our questions, then we can probably go home. To your problem, it's in the right zoning is what it is. This is not Do you want me to answer that question? Do you want me to answer the question? All right, all right, all right. Okay. Let him answer the question. Why don't you, why don't you read it? Okay. Um, John, so are you a recovering addict? Care to share? Yes, yes I am. Uh -huh. Okay. That. Power resident. These are all repeats. What happens? Why don't you give us, you've, you've heard from the community, Sam. 
why don't you give us, I don't know, maybe two questions that we haven't had addressed that would be helpful? Because you've heard a lot of questions over the last few months. I thought that this, was, this was for the residents to address you guys. Yes. We don't address Sam. This is for us to address we, you. We have our questions. We're right. patiently. No, Let me. Wait, I'm trying to think what I, hasn't been, a, you know, brought up already. There's been so many questions. Um, there's been so many questions. All right, I, I got, okay. We, we, listen, I just want to say we really are glad you guys came. We're glad you're interested in the situation. We uh, would like to provide additional information. It's getting late. We, we told the mayor that we would give them an hour. It's been an hour and a half. I think uh, everybody's a little bit tired. Everybody's getting a little bit emotional. We're, we're, so we're, we're going to call it quits for now. Please submit your questions. If you'll let me finish, if you will let me finish. I understand that, but the there's been cards. I understand that. We're, I, I understand your concern. I don't think that I don't think you should feel unsafe. Well, but you can't say that. A person that's elderly is a lot more comfortable yes. than a young family. As yeah. I feel like a target. We, why don't you submit your question? We'll try to respond that's it to you. That's a question. That's a question. I don't okay. I think it's getting out of hand already, so we're going to call it quits for the night. Thank you okay. very much for coming, you guys. Appreciate Thanks it. For the time, guys. All right, folks. <laughs> Hold on. Thank you, Terry. Th Terry and John. Thank you for coming. You know, and and now I want to get to the part of the meeting, and I, I really do thank the residents. I know. You're welcome, Mike. First of all, I just want to I want to thank the residents again for coming. I thank you for um, I know this. No, this is not over. I'm just I'm getting out off the stage here, but the mayor's going to come up and then Mr. Maestros. Or, hold on. Okay. I know that this is an emotional issue and a, and a housing issue for all of you. I understand that and a safety issue. Okay, and we're trying to make uh, make this the get everybody to understand exactly what's going on. Okay, I appreciate everybody that had the patience and was not yelling out. And I understand that everybody's passion, everybody's passionate about this and wants to talk and have something to say. And you will have that opportunity at the end of the meeting tonight. But I think we're going to bring up next the law director. We're going to have him talk on behalf of the city. I've had a ton of questions about you know, uh, how is this allowed? There's been things go out there um, on the, in, on the uh, social media showing copies of our, our legislation and where they say that it is, is not, it's outlawed. And so I'm gonna let the law director come up and then I don't know if Mr. Finch wants to say anything, but again, I've done a lot of research on this the last week and I'd love you guys to hear what I've heard and it may or may not change your mind. I'm not saying it's going to, but I would love for all of you to hear what I've I've heard because I've heard from several of you and I you know I, I we needed to have this meeting tonight uh, whether you, we come out of here with you being happy or still being angry uh, at me at the mayor at the rest of council at the, the law director at the hair the hers um, I just wanted the truth out and that's what we're trying to, to do tonight so uh, at this point I'm gonna have uh, mr. Uh, No, if you, here, here's what we'll do. If you want to, um, he's got a really short, brief presentation, and then we're going to let people ask their questions, okay? So that's fine. Mr. Maestro. And you, these are a couple that I pulled out of here that I think okay. are for you, so you might want to ask. Them. Okay. Okay. 
Thanks, Dan. I, I think the only thing I would ask, I, I'll be more than happy to ask or answer your questions. If you can let me get through what I want to get through, because maybe that would answer some of them as we work through this. So um, I first heard about this about two, three weeks ago, I think. Uh, Mr. Finch said that he received, I believe, a call initially from uh, individuals who owned a home in Twinsburg that wanted to own, open a sober house. Okay. Um, that's the first time I heard about it. I got together with Mr. Finch. We went through our code as far as A, where they're opening it, B, do we specifically regulate it, and C, can we do anything to either prohibit it, regulate it, uh, have some input on what happens there. Okay, this, um, your surprise, your being upset, your being concerned about what's going to go on here was the same concerns that I had with Mr. Finch. This was not a situation where the building department issued a permit. There was no permit issued. There was not a situation where Fint, Mr. Finch or Mr. Rodick gave their approval because that was not necessary. What happened was the hearers, and I didn't even know who they were at the time, it was just an individual who owned a house called, presented this, and we provided the answer, which is, um, based upon simply the Fair Housing Act and the ADA, okay, the city of Twinsburg cannot prevent the opening uh, or, or these tenants being in that location. Okay? Now I'm going to explain and talk about what we can and can't do, okay? but simply put, and, and we have out front um, this, which is, this isn't put together by the city, it's not it's put together by the government. It's put together by, uh, it's a joint statement of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Justice, okay? This came from the DOJ specifically to address these sober houses or these recovery houses because Ohio is about three to five years behind many other states where these things are coming in, okay? So this has been addressed and this was addressed in 2016 and they specifically state the Fair Housing Act, okay? This isn't the City of Twinsburg Code. This is the Fair Housing Act, which trumps whatever we might have on our books, okay? The Fair, the Fair Housing Act, okay, which is a federal act, prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, family status, natural origin, okay? That's the Fair Housing Act, meaning all right, I think we all would agree we cannot say we don't want X religion on our street and living in Twinsburg. We don't want X race. We don't want people from such and such country. Okay, we all agree to, on that. Um, I hope. Okay, the situation that we have is whether or not a recovering alcoholic and a recovering drug dependent individual falls under disability under the Fair Housing Act. The federal courts and the feds have determined yes, okay? Whether you agree with that determination or you don't, that's the answer, is that recovering alcoholics and reco recovering drug addicts are covered by the Fair Housing Act and the ADA, all right? So um, what can we do, all right? So what can we do now? And, and there's, there are things we can do and there are things that we as a city are looking at, okay? As far as regulating how this, facility or how future facilities um, are governed, are, are organized, whether or not they can come in the same city, whether or not they can have more than five people. We're looking at all those restrictions and seeing what we can do. Um, and this is a first impression for the city of Twinsburg. Uh, there are not very many of these in the, in the state of Ohio as far as we're aware. Uh, the state of Ohio does not have regulations in place on these where a lot of other states do. A lot of other states that are dealing with these are trying to regulate them as we speak, and we're keeping an eye on that. I mean, you, you can look at the law. The case law is out there, folks, and I'd be more than happy to look at it, to, to provide it to you. The cities that have gone and said, we don't want drug addicts living in a house or alcoholics living in a house under a, so, un, under a sober house have been sued and they have lost and they have written checks substantial amounts of money okay we're not going to just jump into this and say the hairs you're not coming in here okay that would be a mistake for all of us to do we are looking at it i've already taken the steps to engage counsel okay 
Prior to this, uh, we, we've looked at some law firms that have done some pretty extensive zoning work. Uh, my conversations with them is they haven't crossed this bridge, but they're more than happy to do some research, look at our code, look at existing codes, and see what we can do down the road and in the future to regulate this and control it. Now, that's where we're at, okay? So, what, one second, okay? Um, you know, this is my little bit of uh, opportunity to say, you know, taking a step back, 15 years ago following 9-11, towns had these meetings about Muslim people, right? I mean, it happened. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Folks, I'm talking about the Fair Housing Act, and that's how this thing expands. Because when the issues come up, it originally dealt with race and sex and sexual preference. As these things came up over time, they add to the, what is protected under the Fair Housing Act. Okay? Then, you know, HIV patients started happening, so they started declaring that HIV patients were protected. And where we're at today, okay, where we are at today is that drug-dependent people and alcohol-dependent people are covered. Now, Only what... Recovery. I'm sorry? Only recovery. Correct. <laughs> if they're using, they are not. If they are using, they are not. You're absolutely right. And part of what as we look at this of what we can do, this does not mean we give up any right that we would have in any other residence in the city. If they're violating noise ordinance, if they're violating parking restrictions, if they're violating anything else, if they're not, be, if they're a nuisance to the neighbor, we can enforce that. And I've had long talks with Chief Noga. We have every intention of enforcing that. Um, we don't give up those rights, okay? We certainly have that as a city to control. Now, I'm aware, okay, because when this first comes up, the first thing, you know, we go to is our code and we look. There's two definition sections in our code that apply. One is we define family, and a family under our code means one or more persons occupying a premise and living as a single housekeeping unit, whether or not they are related to each other by birth or marriage. That's how we as a city define family. We also define a residential care facility. Okay, in a residential care facility, I think any reasonable person can make the argument that our definition that this facility would fall under that. Okay, I think you could certainly make that argument, and I would certainly not argue with you. However, Isn't the men just men. Yeah, only men well, that that's their choice, but I'm not sure that they they couldn't they couldn't allow uh, women. But so. <laughs> There's nothing I would say you're going to have four or five women. That's their choice. So, so where we're at with the residential care facility is nowhere in our code does it have a provision where it either prohibits or permits a residential care facility. Interestingly enough, that's the only place that definition appears in the code. Okay. So where we're at as a city is we have a homeowner that wants to rent their property out to four slash five individuals that are covered by the, a, by the ADA. Homeowner or corporation? We have plenty of corporations that rent their property too. We don't, we do not, pro, we do not, we don't prohibit a corporation from being a rent, renter. Okay, because they can. understanding, it is a corporation. Although it is non profit, it is a corporation. The owner of the home is still Mrs. Hare under her maiden name is still the owner. I believe so. Correct. They're, they're running the same business that any other renter would have renting their property. They are collecting rent. The sole source of income is rent. Are we ready for questions yet? Or is well, yeah, property management. Even people that own one or two sometimes will have ABC company that owns their property. The, the, ho the house right now is under her name. Right. So they're using the corporation to rent it out, which is a separate entity to them. So how is that? Why does that matter? Because it's two separate legal entities. So if you have a corporation here running, they would have to rent it to the corporation and then rent it. Right. But we have, there are property management companies that, that do that right now. Can, can I come with my question here? Because it's a little bit 
mic be? Can I use the mic so it gets on the tape? And I can hear it? Okay. Um, by their very definition of this place, that they have a house manager who is supervising the taking of their medicine. So in here in section 294 and 1143, yeah, I don't know if it's 243, I don't have my copy with me, but it is in our zoning code in the definitions of residential care facilities. Supervision in the taking of medications, other services conducive to the resident's welfare. That is in a definition by their very definition of how they are using this. There is nothing to interpretation. I read this to Mr. Yates yesterday. He said that's how I interpret it. It is very clear and plain English how this thing is written. There is no legalese. Yes, I spoke with you about this. About, what? about everything that I'm telling you. I read this and you said this is my interpretation of the code. Well, I'm going to read I what I found. Excuse me. I, I have the floor. I May I speak, please? I'm just going to interrupt you like you did. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> have at it, Ted. You know what? You're absolutely right, and my apologies. So go ahead. Don't try to so speak what I may or may not have said to you. I, have, I can speak for myself, and I sat on the phone with you and said, look, Mike, I'm not going to give you an interpretation. I, I disagree with some of your interpretations. Okay. I told you that, Dave, like I told every resident I talked on the phone, Dave and I have been looking at this for weeks, and we're still continuing to explore our local ordinances and the relation of the local ordinances to what Mr. Maestro has just explained. And I exactly appreciate you still working on it, and you said this is your interpretation of the law is what you said to me, but regardless. Like moving on from that. Why didn't you bring your, your, your piece of paper that? Because I was busy setting up my camera to get all my stuff together here so I could share it with the entire town, okay? So here I am, and thank you for interrupting me as I interrupted them, so you're good. What's your name, sir? Do I know? Chris Griffith. Chris Griffith? Yeah. Oh, are you the one that always hassled me on roundtable? You're the guy. Nice to meet We'll talk later, seriously. So I'm going to get back on subject here. So this place is considered a residential care facility by their very own definition. By their very own definition, and then we go into the chart of conditional uses. Actually, we're going to go one back. We're going to go to... R4 zoning, permitted uses, does not permit for uses of residential care facilities. It says very clearly and plainly, single family homes and signs, see section 1173. That's from memory, but there's only two things. So permitted uses does not permit residential care facilities. So then we go to the next step after that. Then we go to conditional uses permitted. Do you agree with him on that? Can you, can you well, let me, let me finish my point, and then we'll let Dave get up here, Mr. Maestros. So it is not permitted in our four districts. It is not permitted. So then, you know, you, ironically, you can put a mausoleum in, an, our, in any residential district, but you have to get a conditional use permit. So if we want a mausoleum in Mr. Yates' backyard, he can do it, but he has to submit for a conditional use permit. And there is a chart in there that says what uses are allowed in an R4 district in all of the districts residential care facilities are not even available for a conditional use permit so it is plain and simple not allowed it is allowed in a public facility district which is why we suggested to put it in right behind city hall here when i asked mr yates why we would do that he said why would i do that and i said because it's a good christian thing to do and we're helping the community and that was pretty much thrown out so now my question on all of this is that this is a zoning issue. Here's my question. With all of that information, it's very clearly and easy to understand this stuff. Anybody can look it up in the Conway Green. It's all over Roundtable, highlighted very well. My question on this is that this is a zoning issue that is very clear and spelled out, defined perfectly. With your record, and I'm sorry for this, with your record, in zoning case law in Twinsburg that I know is owing a lot, owing everything, are we going to seek outside counsel with someone that knows Twinsburg zoning who has won 11 judgments so that we can get good, accurate representation with the fact that you work, again, my apologies, at the pleasure of the mayor. You have one boss, and if you have a boss who may be misinformed or misguided or confused, you're going to do what you have to do to take care of your job. Or do we receive outside counsel who is unbiased and is going to do what our law says? The zoning code says this is not legal in Twinsburg. Are you open, Mr. Maestros, to receiving outside counsel to represent this? Thank you. That's my question. Okay. Did, did anybody else hear me already say that we've already engaged outside counsel? I said that before Mike even took... 
All right. Can I speak for a moment? There's nothing stopping them guys from moving in at this point. They can't do that without going to the right address. From my experience, I mean, on the Board of Education, I have been involved in the Board of Education. When we had a situation that was too close to everyone, we hired outside counsel with no affiliation. It wasn't a consulting. You, my request is that you are not involved in the process. You hire an outside attorney that submits a report to you and the council and mayor. So no affiliation, no consulting. Hire, go to Jones Day. I've already said that. Yeah, we've, already we've already done that. that. No, so you didn't. You didn't say that. You said you were consulting with them. You were, no, you were conversing with them. Right. We we've been. We said we saw outside counsel. Right. It's already been done. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let let me speak. Let me speak. I said, no matter what Dave and I may interpret this code, all right, we believe that we should go an outside counsel to have a legal opinion on the analysis of our code and and the the relationship to both state and and federal law. Okay, we're willing to do that, okay? And that's what Dave just shared that he was willing to do and that we're looking into and we've already contacted. Walter Haverfield, which is the lead zoning uh, law firm in this well, area right and now. And if that legal firm renders their decision after this is opened on, let's just say it's September 1st. We, we've asked for it before. aggressively pursue whatever that legal firm Are you going to prevent them from opening until you get that? We have, we have asked, continue? we have asked, and Dave and I had talked about this, that they get back to us by the middle of August. We're going to put them on a, on a, on a deadline. We're going to right. work with that right. so that we have this information prior to them opening. Okay. Jenny, if I may then, just because we're on the part of the opening, on their slides they talked about the fact that recovery houses are certified by the NARR. They also said that they are not certified yet. Are you going to let them open without their certification? Well, if you listen to their presentation, and that was the question I had for them, until they get open, they can't seek certification. They have to get open. They have to demonstrate, you know, what the recovery housing they are they're providing. And that was part of their certification process. And with that, it was my understanding, and I've right, looked into it too, because when I met with them, that was the notes I had. I looked at this national organization, and my understanding would be compliance issues that they would have in addition to maintaining that certification. Look guys, this is all new for Tillsburg. This is new for us. This was something that, that came to us with a very specific question. Is there a local ordinance that prohibits this? Okay, based on our code, we didn't believe, okay, and that was all of us looking at it, that our code prohibited them from doing it. They didn't have to come to us, okay? They did not have to make a phone call. They didn't have to, to send an email. They didn't have to do anything. They could have opened this up, and we would have all, you know, been dealing with it the, the same way or even different, okay? But they chose to come this route. I'm not protecting them. I'm not friends with them. So, lady in the picture, what's your name? Sue. Sue. Sue, I have no I have never seen these people before in my life. You guys were but I, know each other. I get around, I try to meet as many people as I can, but I don't even know where they lived on Darien and that came up in this conversation. So but not everybody does. So why don't you get out and walk your community? So why would they stand up there and lie that they didn't know? But anyway, so look, I don't know, I don't know that Sue is hard to hear Hold on. One person at a time. I do, I do, because I've done my research too, and I reached out to some people on the Youngstown board and found out about these sober living homes going in there. And the guy that I talked to that was part of their council said that it was the demise of Youngstown because they had one pop up, then they had another one, then they had another one, then property values fell, which that lady who's moving in back there, welcome to our neighborhood, sorry. Um, but, but their property values fell and he said that if he would have known what he knows now today, they would have tried to get in front of that. I have done my own research, reached out to other counties, other states, to find out how they wrote ordinances. Some of them have said that they've put in good neighbor policy clause, that you can't have one within 500 feet of another one, that only one person can own one in one ward. What are we doing? Because I don't hear That's that. Question. We're, in, we're gonna be in a and I wanna know in Ohio. Why has it taken Twinsburg so long to do yeah, something? I, and I, I can't answer that. I don't know why it hasn't come here. I mean, it, it's coming all over the state. I, I'll just so, yeah, I, okay. know you're, I know. So, um, so you know, I, I've reached out. I've sent emails out to 40 mayors 
saying, hey, we're dealing with this in Twinsburg. What is your guys' experience? Okay. Some of them are coming back to one. I think we have some here, but they do come through our city. Some of them are saying we know about the ones. We've got one that opened up in Manor. I believe our chief uh, did some research on it. He reached out to their chief of police. So far, they haven't had any issues at all with the one in Manor. Um, I know there's there's homes in Lyndhurst which deal with people with disabilities that, that they've been dealing with there, but that's all the information I got there. So we, we it, 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 it is Can't what you I, I understand. I, 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 to get it on the charts and then what is that all going to say, ma'am? Well, why doesn't it say that we can only have one within 500 feet? Why don't we put something in place? Why doesn't it say ordinance requires all good neighbor policy, which will direct occupants to be considerate of neighbors, including refraining yeah, and engaging from excessive loot, profanity? Yeah. Why can't you write an ordinance that says that I, I, they can have a sober living home, but it's one person to a room because privacy? There's a lot of things we can do. When it's five people or less, okay, when it's five people or less, uh, it takes them in a realm that it's very difficult to regulate. These are people paying rent to them. Okay, you have they could have come to us. What, they could have come day. to us. They could have come to us and said, "Hey, we're thinking about renting our, our house out to, to five people. We're going to put two in a room, and then one's going to have a single room." What do you guys think? We'd be like, oh, "We don't care. Go go do that." Everybody. Now, there's a lot of people doing that in Twinsburg. I mean, just because they've labeled them, and, and the problem is, the reason they've labeled them is because they're protected. You heard them stand up there. They didn't I enter into this light. Mayor, but in, in okay. order for us, when you have this meeting with them, what was wrong with you saying, hey, obviously you don't have enough of a business plan because they couldn't present it here tonight. They couldn't even answer some of the questions. What was wrong with you saying, Mr. and Mrs. Her, I respect you coming to me. Why don't you go back and do some homework? I'm going to go back and do some homework. Let's convene again. Let me go out and talk to my residents who voted me in here. See what their stance might be. Because let me tell you, Mr. Mayor, that if you think, and, I, and I'm sorry because there are people in here that are recovering, but right now if you think people are going to embrace these guys, I think you're highly mistaken. And I'm going to tell you why. Most of it is because we didn't get the facts from our council and our mayor. And that's your fault. You should have gotten in front of this. The minute you heard it, you should have got the facts. Because what happened to you is the telephone. One person said it, one person said it, and it went around and it's biting you in the butt. Well, it's not, you should have gotten in front biting, of this. There's nothing biting me. This is something that we've been dealing with. This is something that we've been dealing with. This is something we don't take. We haven't taken We want these people to get out of running a residential neighborhood with kids. None of council, none of council has ignored your calls. I haven't ignored anyone's calls. I didn't say you did. This is saying, not the right zone. Why can't why can't you say to them here, or why can't you say to them up the, the property that you own up off of Pros Road that's close to those five hundred and seven hundred thousand dollar homes up there? Why not them? I mean, why can't you say that if to they them? They decided to do that. I can't tell them what to do with their property. Don't you understand that? I, I do. I do understand that. You but I also know that you have a the way they changed the occupancy code. The right. Ohio, the Ohio Administrative yeah. Code. Director. And so if it comes out that they are now 40, even though it could change the type of residential housing, they have to be in compliance. That also means that they're, so it's not just me renting a few homes out, you're changing it. And in Ohio Administrative Code, there also is answers and I mean, questions that they need to ask that they don't have all the answers for us if it's a care facility. And they have to follow building code, fire code. So instead of like, we're not, listen, people need help. I get that. I want you to know, like, my next door neighbor, somebody can have that. I get that. And I understand that. But you're going to run it. Do you know the rate of fraud among this type of businesses, these sober homes, they use these people that need recovery, and you can look it up because I'm a certified fraud examiner, and I don't like it. But I want to protect our community, and I want to make sure that people are treated well. If these people want a great start, great. But you have to develop a dwelling according to code. So do you think the state fire marshal and the Ohio Administrative Code, you can kind of go to that section? Because if you take it that way, it needs to be up in compliance. Five men in a home, ADA compliant. We brought up ADA. I'm in a wheelchair. Can I get up and down and around? If it's not in compliance, then they can't have that boarding home like that. If, if, Ohio, if Ohio Administrative Code is in conflict with federal law, it's Trump. It's it ain't exactly okay. true because you it have exactly to build up a code. What are you going to have, a fire hazard? Fire hazards going to be up there. There's a balance there. You're not discriminating them. You're saying if, if I want to open a medical facility within my home, I have to have smoke detectors and all sorts of fire code added. 
You don't just get to say, you know, yes, you can have this, but guess what? You have to comply with this code. Because you know what? That's their safety. It is. So that is, so what I do need is that you guys kind of pull that part together because we'll work, we'll work it and I'd be more than happy to get some of our real estate lawyers over to you guys to just help you out with it because Ohio and nationally are different codes in different states. But a lot of different states are also putting in different specifications. So you come in with the program, with the process. So we might not be able to do everything now, but I would be more than happy to help with all of that. Are also, are also for about six or more residents. Okay, Aurora had that same issue. One of the issues they were dealing with, the reason they could do some of the things they did is because it was six or more residents. But some of the things they did, they just did. And they, I mean, if they got challenged, it would be a very difficult part for them to overcome. Do you have a question, Kevin? Okay, so um, just super quick, um, on council, how many of you are in support of civil homes and our community by raising your hand? Thank you. Okay, none of you? How many of you are opposed to them? Yeah, okay. 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 I've talked to them about having Ross come in there um, and, and see to the length that it's not inhabitable, to see what the damage is. Um, I, I don't know. I'm relying on that they are saying that nobody could go in there now, but I've talked to them tonight about meeting Ross up there and having him go through that property, yes. If they, if they pull permits because of work they need to do in the house, then we'll be inspecting you know, I mean, we, we put, try to put in a rental inspection policy, and it's got, you know, outrage about that, too, in this community. and. And we, you know, we ended up forcing because other communities were having difficulties with too shutting that down. But you know, that was one of the reasons that we want to try to you know have a policy like that so we can maintain properties here. If we get our house appraised today, oh, sorry, sorry I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now I just want to finish. So um, I guess I'm just going to start with you know the communications. I, I'm I'm extremely disappointed that um, you and Dave and Russ and Larry. <coughs> Had the information weeks ago. From my understanding, you didn't even share it with the council. Um, I'm not sure if I was on council how I would take that. Um, you set them up for you put them in a very bad position. Um, I wouldn't want to be in their position to find out on Tuesday when you've known for weeks what's coming down the pipeline. You knew that this would be an emotional topic. You failed to you failed to communicate with your own council and you failed to communicate with this community. And let me finish. And the rollout, and don't make faces at me. Yeah, I sat in a rotary meeting with you, with Lisa Coates talking about this addiction problem, and at that point you didn't even share that this was coming down the pipeline. So my disappointment that you are not communicating to this community and your own council is disturbing. Disturbing. And now, I am glad you are going to finally get somebody that will look at this after I've been asking for the last week and a half and nobody would give me an answer that we would actually have another outside council look at this but my question is is what question what what are you requiring from them are you just having them look at our code or you have them look at our charter what are you asking the outside council to do because if you're just asking them if we're within our rights or are we following fair housing acts i know what the answer is going to be so I don't want you guys to manipulate this into a very easy answer for them that is not, I want them to be looking at the whole picture. We have no, we have no intent or no reason or motivation to, to lead them in any direction at all. I mean, okay, and yeah, that's great. I mean, we're, we're looking for them to provide analysis of both our, our I mean, our, our code is includes our charter and as our charter and how it relates to both federal and state law. I mean, we want a legal opinion on where we stand. You know, we have, interpretations of our code that differ from what we feel we can enforce here okay and so that's fine we want a second opinion on that so we're going to have that that's analyze right. and let it put a legal opinion legal opinion it, it, okay it's in, in the law from world is a very serious document okay legal opinion is a very serious document it's not taken lightly and it's not going to be a cheap process but again it's something that if they're willing to put their name on it and say, this is our legal opinion of this it should be something that we should all be able to work with. Right. 
Okay. But I, as I go back to you, had you done this, what was the exact date that you actually knew? I need a date. Can anybody give me a date? So, yeah, so when we first got approached a date. by the years, I don't want a story, I want a date. I'm giving you, I'm, I'm I don't giving want you, a story, I want a date. Background. I'm giving you some background on your date, okay? <laughs> All right, so it, when we were first approached, again, it was a simple question. It was a simple question to our building department. Is there anything in your local order prohibited? Dave and I brought it to, Larry brought it to us. It was probably, and I think the response was June 20th, is when the response was. To them, there was a one sentence. Mr. Here, there's nothing in our zoning code that we can see that would prohibit this from happening. So you need before June 20th. When we, were you right. initially <laughs> notified that these? I don't know the date. But it was before June 20th. Okay. Sometime okay. before June 20th, so, obviously. Since, so That's here's the month. situation. You're not communicating with us. I mean, this, and you know my, my, my situation. I'm not going to leave one in 15 individuals get through this program successfully. One in 15 statistically. So we know that the first five, four of them are going to fail. Four of them are going to fail, and one of them has a 20% chance of actually getting through this program. They are going to be evicted. They would not answer the question. The eviction is to the curb. So those individuals are going to be, as she said, potentially without a car and without home. That is considered homeless. We are going to have addicted homeless men on the street. My 86 year, 85 year old mother I, now, I have to worry about her safety. So, so I, had I, I known on June 20th, look, look. I would have moved her. But look. now on August look. 2nd, I don't know. This one, sorry. I, 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 get, I, get, I get the whole situation. I, it's not that I, I, no, you I don't. understand. You don't, because you're not in my position. I understand, I understand the situation. And I understand the concerns. I think our minds all go to a negative area when we think of these homes. You know, I, I, we've heard from both people that support this and people that that don't. I mean, we've heard both sides. I understand, our, and I guarantee you, our police force and our fire. Uh, we have our fire chief here. We have a police chief here. We have an officer standing here. They will know where this house is, and they will know what's going on there at all times. I but you have you failed that. to okay. give me time. You have failed to give me time to find adequate home uh, housing for my mother. You have failed, and you have failed to provide me adequate time to find safe shelter for my mother. Because statistically, I know that these individuals are going to be homeless on my street, on my mother's street. You I, failed I my I mother. Say, I, I, I mean, how can we say that? Sir, you've been waiting for a long time. You guys realize that the acres is 40 the acres have their crest weight stuff, it's 40 percent right now. Right. Now. right. Now. right. Now. So, 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 the so he's saying that, that he's saying that 40 percent the, the acres right, right now is about 40 percent of rental property. So 20 percent of that becomes silver homes. Okay. What's going to happen to our property values back then? Well, I was just going to say, yeah. we get our house we have to dis right. We have to disclose one, one of the issues we're challenged with is, in, and that's a good statistic, 40% of the acres is rental. I don't know that if that's an adequate, if the proper number or not. But what, when we start trying to mingle and say, okay, a business can't operate our home, are we now going to classify rental property as a business? If we are, I'm going to have to shut down 40% of the acres, homeowners, and say we spent right now. They in there for a home business. But they understand that's a problem we're doing. So let me ask this question. If we, wait a minute. There's a lot of people raising their hands, man, right behind you, so I was like, yeah, I, I asked two questions. I wrote one down, was answered, but it was answered incorrectly. The second question that I asked, because NARR requires that they, that hers, take their personnel, either the ones they're hiring or the ones they're accepting into their homes, and do a background check on them. Okay, okay and they said they weren't doing that. Yeah, um, well, they said they were, they were looking into that. Now, that's a good point, because if they become certified with NARR, then that would be a compliance issue that put on us to maintain that certification. So I would hope that, and I would encourage them if they end up doing this, that they get that certification, because if, if that's a requirement, they they have to get that certification operating. I don't know if they do. I again, I don't know the ins and outs of the silver house. They don't. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the. I don't know the things. Who's responsible for monitoring and holding them to 
ask for all the things that he says he can do as far as I, I get his road testing. I don't think twice a month is sufficient. But he's going to hold him responsible to do that. certain businesses in town that I would have said, you know what, I don't like that. It's not that we don't want to do it, it's where they're doing it. I understand what I'm saying is that we're more on the same page than on the opposite page. It's just us trying to find a way that we get into a, a legal situation with them and they sue us and we end up paying them a quarter million dollars. They pay off that house and they buy another one next door. I understand. Then we got President Twinsburg and we're, we're, we're helping Can we get our houses for today and they go down the will give us the difference? medication then there's four of them in a controlled another controlled cabinet or safe that they're looking at a fingerprint operation of the house manager so the house manager does not administer medication the house yes, manager has control of all of the safes all the safes with that two people will have control of every safe in the house you made it very clear in our neighborhood meeting okay which means the house manager will have control of the safe and the person that's taking the drugs are going to be control of the safe and remember it's a it's a revolving door house which means you could have someone for two weeks, three weeks, which means that if Housemaster has the combination of all five safes and the liquor damage. Okay. It was my understanding, it was my understanding in my notes that the house I'm just manager- just trying to make sure you guys understand that this is how it's gonna be because she already told us what she wants. Well, in, in my notes, this is what I understood, is that the, only the resident had the access to his own safe. The house manager has access, is the only one that has access to the safe holding the individual safe. The house manager is not there to administer medication. The house manager is there to make sure that if someone is on medication, that they take that medication and they're taking he, a proper dose and they're, they're locking. He's, he's he has to have a combination here with the next tenant. That's he what we're trying to say. He is distributing. Yeah, he's that's, got a, that's, a very, that's a that's technical, I guess that's a technical I, definition I, that we'd have to figure out. Is I get opening up a safe and allowing him to get another one out. Is that? Peter, I will send you that information with your law director on the administrative code. Those questions they need to ask. We only have one thing that addresses is that care facility. That the one thing that we lost. Just clarification on your outside counsel. You mentioned the second part of it. I missed it, or I didn't listen. You said the one that we're considering. I've never had cases like this. No, what I'm saying is that in Ohio, these cases have not gone all the way up the court chain like they have in other states because they've been around. Okay, we they're familiar with them. Okay, and they're familiar with what we can do. And we talked about, and some other people have talked about the regulations you can do regarding these, regarding the number of occupants that can go in there, regarding controlling um, the manager and having specifications for the manager and things like that. So there's two parts to that. First of all, we're going to get the legal opinion on where we currently stand, and then an advisory opinion on what we can do going forward, putting some of these regulations in place 
to prevent them. The newest trend of cities is to try to limit the number of these, whether it's on a street, within a certain distance of each other, within a certain area of the city. Now, the belief is that that will not sustain the FHA and the ADA, but we'll find out. Those cases are in court right now. disability based upon the simple fact that they're, they're there. that they're well, there that, I mean that you know from a weapons under disability standpoint they'd all be under a recognized disability being a, a, a drug addicted or alcohol addicted individual This has been litigated. This is this is not new. Okay, this is this has been litigated all the way up in the Sixth Circuit, which is a federal court that governs us. It, it's been brought up there. Okay, and they, like I said, they keep expanding um, the number of classifications of the individuals that are, are meet criteria that fall under ADA and Fair Housing. That, that keep it. Four people, 24 hours a day. I, I don't know that. I, I don't know. Not. 
so how they're saying it's gonna happen. I don't know. I mean they're not mine. They're not mine. They yeah, they're, they do yeah, they're 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 you know, this is in a in my understanding, this is in a transitional in transitional phase of their life where they're trying to work their way back into being independently moving. I mean they they're just looking for a safe place to live that takes them out of their a area they were before that Yeah, sure. I just want to say I know some of you guys have heard some of your concerns and, and a lot of what you're saying is I understand where they're coming from too of what their situation is. Um, but I would urge you to contact also your state representative too. Um, I know she you know, would be another person that would uh, be able to help possibly put some kind of state regulation on these. Um, but I mean, right. I, I agree. I mean, I, we're not shutting the door on any, right. any outside help we can get to, to, to try to address this because again these are this is happening in municipalities all over the place I mean I, I sent it out to 40 mayors um, you know and I got about four or five responses and you know we're all kind of dealing with this this is you know this is something that's going to be you know coming to all of our neighborhoods that we just need to try to address I'm sorry yes you mentioned the responses you said two of them from Lakewood men are were good the other ones can you tell us what they said I mean well, Aurora, well, Aurora had, I know we've been dialoguing with Aurora. Aurora had one that was six to ten people, I believe. About ten. about ten people that they had that was just really kind of a property that was set up, and I'm sure it was part of, I don't know if someone mentioned fraud, but there was a lot of stuff going on. It was causing issues with their police department, and so they were able to shut that down based on the fact that it was creating, it was basically a criminal house of, you know, and that was an issue that Aurora took. Um, I haven't received any responses that have said, this is bad, you need to get it out of your neighborhood. I mean, most of the municipalities just haven't dealt with it. And it's something new that, and again, that doesn't mean they're not there. Like, you know, the thing that I want to emphasize is that these people came to us with, with, a, with a question, they didn't have to do that. They could have opened this up without even coming to the city. Um, you know, I don't want to say we're fortunate, we're fortunate that they, you know, came to us something beforehand. Something on the books regarding that, that if something like this opens up from now on, that that person has to, you know, at least inform the city. If, if there is a way we can regulate it, we will. Okay? That's what we're looking at. Okay? We can't just, I can, you know, it's like I talked to council. I'm like, you guys can write any ordinance you want. You want to write an ordinance and just says, we don't want them in any neighborhood. We're going to get sued and we're going to lose and we're going to pay a lot of money. But if that's what they want to do, they can do that. Okay, so I mean, that that is that is something that we're looking. Okay, the reason we're getting an opinion is if there's that opinion will give us our standing to say whether something in our current code will allow us to regulate it, or if there's if there's additional ways that are being reg these are being regulated it's in other municipalities. In California, they wrote a code that said- The same California. I know, but they wrote, but listen to me, they wrote a code that said you can't have it within 500 feet of each other. What are you guys doing? You don't understand, this is my property value. This is what I call home. So you can't write nothing, you can't write something that says Sue. that if this takes place, this one's grandfathered Sue, did you hear what I just said? I, I said, look, it, I, I'm not opposed to regulating it. But you're I'm not, not even I'm, I'm going out to the research. I mean, try to write an emergency charter and get it on the books. Yes. Well, it's obvious there's only so much a city can do. I'm just curious from a legal standpoint. Since Glenwood Acres is a defined view, what is the legal possibility of the form of an owner's association? And its bylaws dictating how a house can be rented. It wouldn't change this house, but moving forward, since there is such a high rental density there, perhaps in the future, say how a house can be I guess if the home association, if they created a home association in the acres, and I'm shooting from the hip guys, okay. I know what home associations have in their rules. If, a home, if you created a home association and you got a majority of the residents to pass that, and you as a home association were going to enforce that with your own funds or with your own legal means, then there's nothing that the city would be involved in. It's the same way. You want to you want to ban outdoor above ground pools in the acres? You can form an association and do that, but the city's not going to get involved in enforcing that. Well, that's what I mean. That might be a better way to The only thing I the only thing I would say. One second. From a, from a, oh, go ahead, Dale.
the, yeah, the only thing I would say on that, just so we don't give the wrong impression, if the HOA does it, the HOA would have to govern renting across the board, not just in this specific instance. You couldn't target this. It'd have to be all rentals. And right. Again, those would, you would, so typically when a home association in areas and buys like that, it becomes part of the deed. So every person would have to redo their deed and make it part of the deed so it runs the land on their property in the future. Those that chose not to do it could not be bound by it. So, so in the future, on a property, you may be able to, but my guess though is that when Sam thought about it, saying, why would I put property right restrictions on my property personally with, for no benefit? But, you know what I mean? So, but again. Mr. Yates, I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. Chief is here. We will enforce all. Of, there he is. So we will enforce. We will enforce. We will enforce all of our our local ordinances and anything we need to enforce to make sure things are, are happening properly at this house. What you know the radar stuff. So if it becomes a nuisance, we start getting a lot of calls from the police department, fire department. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at that point, you know, then you would be able to. If, if everything Correct. else fails, you can't get the occupancy, whatever. There's something on your end. Of uh, absolutely. Okay. And again, I said, look, if, if there is a way for us to regulate this, we will find a way. If there's not, Are then you, we're going to share with you. You're not, you don't seem to me like you're, you're really re re ready to fight for this. Yes, All the people in here, from what I gather, I the majority of the people in here, want, but don't the, want this in there, right? But right. 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 they came to me and said, we're not going to do this here, I'm fine with that. I'm not. I'm not campaigning for this thing to happen. What I'm saying is that well, it doesn't, I don't know like you are. Is what I'm saying. You, you, it doesn't sound. It sounds like you're not really willing to fight for what for the people that live here. You're rather fight what for would the you person like, this what, what would you like me to do? What, what would you like me to do? I would like you to listen to Mr. Turok because he basically explained exactly why you can't fight this to me out in the hallway. I'm not running for council. Mr. Turok, this might be a legal opinion and we'll go litigate on it. I'm sure that we understand what he is. Can I ask a question? Can a legal battle and support you than let him have to do this? I'm all for these guys getting help. It's not the right place. There's little kids there. 
Yeah. Do you not understand that? Are you a parent? Okay, would you would you like that? Would you like that with your kids? Would you like that with your kids? Yes or no? Would you like five men in recovery around your kids? I understand what you're saying. Would you like it? Yes or no? Just answer that question. I am not. Yes or no? I'm not going to take it. You can't. I'm not going to take an opinion because I don't know. I've never been exposed. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I have talked. Hold on. I am talking. So this is an issue that I have no experience with. I'm not going to take an opinion because I don't know. I've never been exposed. Hold on. Hold on. I have talked. So this is an issue that I have no experience with. Okay. I don't want to say, I may not like living next to you, but I don't know what that means like. I, you know, I have no idea. I've never, I've never lived next to you, Sue. I can't say what my opinion is because I don't know enough information on it. I would, if I had kids, okay. I would, I can tell you that so, we've been involved in abuse and everything else. Yes, I do. I know this is the problem. I've seen it in California. I have a son who's out I know what she's talking about. It never works. It's a mess. They have these people in these rehab houses. They have friends that commit priests they're stealing the drugs, they're selling them. They're taking it out. Priests and so like, oh, there's a drug house here. Let's go raid it. Get the police department ready because that's what you're going to have. Okay. That's exactly what well, you're going to we'll have. We'll be ready for it. We'll be ready. I just want to know. I want to ask you a question. What do you want to say there to the mother and the father who live across the street from them when somebody goes berserk? and hurts one of their kids or kills them. What are you going to say to them? I understand your point. I, I get your point. Well, then, I, you then help us. You guys don't. You don't even act like you care about this. Oh. Oh. Help us. We're more passionate oh. about this than you are. We've done hours of research. We're coming to you and saying, oh, you? please, Mr. Law Director, okay. please counsel, which I'm going to tell you right now. You know, I am highly, I'm highly disappointed in this guy. Yes, ma'am. Very high. Yeah. Me, you two, Sam. Yeah. I talked to yeah. like people. We did talk. And, and I am. Yeah. And I am. Yeah. Yeah. We can't do nothing about we it. We can't all hear what I'm talking about. Yeah. They're getting off stuff. It's not. We can't hear. Uh, the question was, is this a done deal? Okay, is this house going to come in? I can't answer that question right now. Based on what we've analyzed of our code and, and the way it relates to the Fair Housing Act and the ADA, I think it's very difficult to stop this thing. So that's why we're going to go to outside council. Okay, I think we need to do that uh, as a community. I think you guys want us to do that. So we're going to go outside candidate. We're going to get a legal opinion on what to verify if either we are wrong or we're right or there's something else that we're missing. Okay, so that's where it's at. Yes, Hi. Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for having a council meeting and for having us here. so that if there's anything going on at that house, 
or as a new person comes in, that house manager can meet the residents of that surround that area. Um, and I don't know if that's disingenuous or not. I mean, I, I mean that's what they told me when I asked. I said, you know, if there's a way so that the residents in in the acres and around there know when people are coming, when people are coming out, and they have direct contact with um, if they have direct contact with the house manager, so that if they ever have a question or they see something, or you know if there's a new person moving in, they contact and say, hey, we'd like to meet them. And then, you know, at least it might break down some of that barrier for both the residents that are there and the people that live next door. I don't know. I mean, that was something I threw out in the meeting. Um, they didn't shoot it down. They thought, you know, at least the house manager knowing who lives, you know, all around there and them having his contact number was a good idea. I don't know. I mean, so I, I can't speak for, for them because if it is coming, then I, I agree with you. I, there should be something that, as a community, we can, from a monitoring standpoint, from a support standpoint, you know, we can try to help them. Can you can you make them offer a judgment for residents first? Instead of instead of a bunch of transients? Um, yeah, I don't I I don't I don't know. I mean I guess we can we can suggest anything we want to. Yeah. If it's coming out of their pocket to pay for this and running it up to her gym and opening up for gymnastics. Gym in her house would be the same thing as them taking their property and running it up to this corporation to do business. I, 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 mean, so I can, I can answer that. The, 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 the difference there is... Yeah, the, the difference there is that this is a landlord who owns property renting it out for use of a residence versus using a residence for the use of a gymnastics facility. This is the use. This is what it's zoned for, is residential use, and these people are living there as a house household. Right. I mean, that's the difference. They're living there as tenants well, as the business versus well, gymnastics. They're so providing a good in service. Yeah. They're still providing a good service. Every, land, every landlord is providing that service, yeah. I mean, which and is And that's the challenging part for us is, in, in essence, when you break it all down, I mean, I asked them, are you associated with any agency or a government? No. All right, who's paying the rent? The tenants are paying the rent, okay? Um, you know, their application, if you look at what their application is and all the requirements they have, you could write an application for someone else. I mean, if I wanted to write an application for a tenant to rent a room in my basement, I could say, look, I'm going to urine test you every other week. you got to go to meetings. you got to do this, and it's in your lease agreement. And if they sign it, I can evict them on it, okay? doesn't mean I'm providing a rehab service to them. 
that, that's the that's the fine line of what they're doing. They're not providing any rehabilitation services. They're providing a house with rules in a lease that makes it a sober environment for those staying there. It's a difficult, it's a very challenging and a very gray area in the law. I mean, it really is. I mean, this is not- They're a nonprofit. That says they're right in their corporation what their yeah. use is of the corporation. She stubbed out the presentation. I, I think they're, I think it's wrong. I mean, I, I do. I think they're not providing a service. When I ask all the questions that they're asking, they're not, they're not in essence providing any kind of services there. They're providing, they're renting rooms to people in recovery. So that's brought to you. Yes, I'm sorry. Is it true that somebody like in one of their immediate families, like let's say a parent, owns several houses down there? Yeah. Like Could you speak up a little bit louder? I, I had heard something, and I'm wondering if it's true that one of the, the people that own the house, one of their parents owns and actually runs several of these houses I down in the Copley area. And I, if so, I mean, do they have success stories, you know, statistics, anything to provide on how those houses are doing? You mean the parents? Um, the parents of the people that were here that are running that. I've never heard of like that.
You know what? That's a that's a federal law. That's a federal regulation. They have to turn that in. They have to. I mean, I got to be sure they did. I I didn't discuss arms, but I got to put firearms and prohibited in the South. But oh, I can verify that. Yeah, yeah. That I was going to say. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've said this a bunch of times on the page. So if I sound like a broken record, I'm speaking for myself. I think I speak for a lot of people. We are not insensitive to the needs of these people. That's we right. applaud their effort to try to get rehabilitation. We are not insensitive to the need for this type of facility. We simply want it in a properly zoned location, right. which is where it belongs. With all that, our zoning, as I clearly understand it, and it may be up to a different interpretation. I apologize if I saw the confrontation I was a little hot earlier. I apologize sincerely, but we the way I, going you know me, <laughs> you know I make a mistake if I get to it, but as I understand the zoning, it's very clear, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in there, it clearly says, then we bring in this document, I'm holding up the Federal Fair Housing Act, as I read through this, I don't see anywhere that we violate the act, the only time that this trumps our local zoning is if we violate it, we are not discriminating by age, race, gender, creed, national origin, sex, disability is the big one here. We are not disabled or we are not discriminating against this type of facility. We are only saying that if we have this recreational care for, excuse me, residential, yeah, not recreational. <laughs> 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 sorry, <laughs> sorry. But if we are to have a residential care facility, which by their very definition of how they are using it, falls into our zoning code definition as a residential care facility, you can have that. We cannot have that in the residential or in any residential district and we have places that it can be and that is all we i think most of us we're not against this thing we just want it in the right place to give these people the best possible support network that they can follow their path to sobriety so let's say, okay for giggles and kicks for giggles and kicks let's say we go with mike's interpretation all right you guys enforce that so they sue us they have to prove that, what, what are their damages? So their damages would be rent, rental income, correct? What else would be their damages? So for me, if it's $2,400 a month, or whatever it is they're bringing in, the 400, or not even two grand, what are they bringing in? Oh, so they're bringing in $1,800 a month. So for Giggles and Geek, we say, you know what? You're right, we're gonna interpret this as Mike is saying, and they say, you are violating my, our, our rights. They take us to court and, they, and, and we lose. Let's say we lose. Um, it drags out in court for probably what? Three, six months. Um, so. Three, six years. Okay, so three, six years. So let me do the math here. So I mean. Well, we moved, moved, but so, and you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is so, so I'm saying so the worst case scenario is is they would be they would be awarded the eighteen hundred dollars. So that's what I'm asking. What would they be awarded? It, here here's the the flaw in that. Okay, because sometimes from a legal standpoint, you take a position that you have reason to believe is contrary to law because you're going to take that position to prevent the other side because they won't fight the fight. Here's the difference. The ACLU will be here also joining that suit. Okay, so it's not a matter of them not finding a lawyer. And the second part of this Hold is, on, wait, so wait, wait, wait. In, case, in other cases they have joined yes. definitively? Yes. Okay. okay. So y you would do the, your, in, under your theory or your plan is if we do this and we have as a law director, my legal opinion, then we get a separate legal opinion, and let's say that separate legal opinion tells the city and t council the same thing, that you cannot bar these people from going there, and then we do it, okay? There's a punitive damages element there that's gonna be pretty significant, because you've been told by two different sets of lawyers you can't do it, and we're doing it anyway. Okay. So the case, and I'd be happy to give it to you, it's fairly prominent if you go online and look, it's out of Minnesota, I believe. It was a $400,000 judgment, $400,000 in attorney's fees, a certain dollar amount of punitive damages, they were lucky enough to settle out for 500,000 in the city. That simply said the same thing that you're talking about. Let's just say no. Right, so when you take on a case, so it's when you, so regardless of what, so if you take on a case and you you feel that it's not 
Um, you get it onto the docket. You know, at what point do you decide? I mean, so you as our city attorney have the authority to pull it off the docket at any time or? Well, you're always evaluating that. You're always evaluating the merits, the cost-benefit analysis of it. You're evaluating the, the penalty or the risk of, and who's at risk. And I, I get that all of you are at risk. You pull it off the but docket that, after a month and a half. Yeah, but that doesn't happen. Can if we do this, we will be sued. Yeah, we're not we the one sued. We control the docket. They'll control the docket. Yeah. We're the defense. Well, they will be pulled, suing us. When you pulled that one case off the docket for the, yeah, the we, little boy, what did, I mean, how did you get to pull that one off? The little boy. The one that um, got hit. You know what I'm talking about. How'd you pull that one off the docket? A criminal case? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, criminal case. You were at the party. I don't know. Right, a criminal case is significantly How'd you pull different. That one off the docket? We were prosecuting. We were prosecuting. Yeah. Right, we were prosecuting, right. and then you pulled it off the docket. Like what? Right. What made that, you determine that, to do that? Because if you're the one that brings the case, we wouldn't be bringing this right. case. We would okay. be defending. Yeah. Somebody else sues that's the like, city. That's like someone suing you, and they decide they don't want to be in a lawsuit with you, so they'll dismiss it. You gonna let them do that? Well, I wouldn't. If if my little boy got beaten, I wouldn't let. No. Him, I wouldn't let anybody. We're not beat. talking about little boys being beaten. I'm talking in general. Well, I am. General legal <laughs> process. I'm saying, if they sue us, we can't do anything to dismiss the case. I didn't really get to answer or ask. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. You've been waiting a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the communication. No, I'm sorry. Back in, behind you. Line. Behind you. Okay. So what they're trying to do is admirable enough, and I know they have to start somewhere, but with all of their probabilities and potentialities, it makes me nervous that we're their guinea pig. Well, I think one of the reasons that we tried to help facilitate this and encourage them to do this, okay, again, they didn't have to do this. We encouraged them to do this. We said there's a group of residents you need to hear. I wanted them to hear, you know, the outburst. I wanted them to hear. I wanted them to understand the neighborhood they're dealing with because it's hard to relate that in my one-on-one -on -one meeting with them here is here is some of the pushback that we're dealing with and that you're going to deal with should you move forward with this that was part of that was part of the reason that we tried to help facilitate this okay i was surprised they were told they were told by their i mean he's an attorney but by their marketing representatives and whatever there is that you stay as far away from any kind of town hall meetings you can but they came here i mean so, yes, Just a quick comment sure. when they came and talked to me. Because to be honest with you, I observed people, they didn't care. They didn't care about any of the anger or any of the concern, and they exhibited that the whole night. I give them credit for being. I'm not going to disagree with but, you. But they didn't care. Right. Can you repeat what your plan is to communicate to us, the residents, the legal findings from the outside room? Would you repeat that, please? Yeah, we can publish it. I mean, it's going to be a public record, so how, as soon as how, we get it. How will you? Some of us aren't real active with politics. Well, you're how will you do that? Uh, we'll probably, um, it'll definitely come out at a council meeting. Um, when's, um, that, when's the next council meeting? meeting? Yeah. It'll be shared, it'll be shared immediately with um, a, a city council. Um, so, I mean, are we going to throw it out on Facebook? Probably not, but. Mike will. Do you know? Know. Come on. But we won't, you know, so maybe a three day lag till he gets it, then he'll put it out there. But. Are we going to have another meeting before they actually put these residents in here? Um, I mean, is somebody going to go and I, take our questions and our concerns and do some due diligence or counsel people and actually go and try and do something to help us to put our minds at ease? Because even though you say it's not affecting us, I mean, clearly. I, I never said it's not affecting us. Clearly, clearly, though, with our property values, it is. There was a house that sold on that street. That lady was here. She's worried. She might have to get an attorney. So it is going to affect us. And so I want to know the research that I've done. Can I not sit down and meet with you people? Can we not write an emergency ordinance and get it on the docket? Can we not try to get, see, because that cavalier attitude kind of like bothers me. So what I'm saying to you <laughs> I, is- My door's that, always open. I, I well, mean, you but, can always stop it. Okay, uh -huh. I, I know that. So what I'm saying to you is, are we going to have another meeting and how are we going to try to get in front of this? What is our another meeting now? with with the hearers, or just another meeting? Another with the meeting city? to answer all of our questions, questions that are brought up here tonight after we go home and think about it. I think we need another town hall. I really do because this isn't going to go away, and people are going to leave here tonight, and we're going to think about things, and other people bring up good points. So instead of you filtering a hundred yeah. phone calls, I think it warrants us getting together again. I well, think it's I a think, big enough you issue. Know, council, council comes off. Um, 
the last week of August. Um, that's prior to their I'll potential potential opening. Um, hopefully, we've got a legal opinion by then. Uh, okay. We can probably set up a caucus an hour before, hour and a half before, that we're all going to be here again, and we can okay. we can have any kind of discussion you want. But because I think we're going to do some research, some of us we're going to go out. Yeah. I'm still going to keep reaching out. Um, I've already called Chris Hall over at Macedonia. I'm doing it too, just to follow up on you guys. I'm helping you out a little. Thank so, you. I know, you need it. You guys have been busy up at the golf course, so I got yeah. it. So, I'm helping you out. So, I just want to make sure that we're all going to get back together and bring our facts. You said uh, Aurora had a house and they had a lot of problems and they shut it down. Did they, did they change any codes or ordinances to stop any more? You no, know I don't believe. I don't believe they changed any of their. I don't believe they changed any of their existing. At least I don't, I'm not aware. I mean, I can find out. I don't believe they changed their existing board because I think they might. Yeah. Ted, what, what I guess would be to stop the herbs from just saying we're just going to run it out to five people and they just get five addicts? No, no, no. So, so the issue, I guess, from a legal standpoint, so I understand because obviously, you know, I don't know that we, you, as a city, want to get into a slippery slope of regulating who you can rent to, right. you know. So if, if, if the herds just decided that, hey, we're just gonna rent it out and we're gonna have five people just stay here, and they just so happen to be recovering addicts, that that would be the fine, that would be fine. I guess the question for the zoning is because they're calling it a sober house and yeah. they're running it through this nonprofit. So I guess if, if she were just to say, well, forget the nonprofit. And we're just going to collect four hundred dollars a month or whatever. Five guys are going to live. Guys going to live here and pay a week. Do we have? Do we have zero? Yeah. I mean, standing. And that's correct. the challenging yeah. part that we we've been dealing with. I mean, what's the difference in a, in a kid graduating from college, buying a house anywhere in this town, and says, "I'm going to rent out to four of my buddies that that also go in there," and and they bring them in. And I mean, they, we yeah, can't I stop them that, from that's doing that. That's my concern. Is that if you start. If you start down the one road of you know, saying, who you probably can, more going out of that house. Than <laughs> yeah, so, you know, who you can rent to, that, and how would that affect? You know, because there's there's quite a few families in Twinsburg that own multiple houses that rent houses out to people. And I think the last thing, I mean, obviously you had mentioned it earlier when you tried to do a rental, you know, inspection, you know, that 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 went that went over very bad, and, and you guys ended up pulling it from the book. So I just want to make sure that you know. Whatever, whatever route that the city's going is that you're, you're being very careful so that you're not. Absolutely, and I think that's why, else. I mean, that's why we're gonna get a legal opinion. Right. I think that's why, you know, that's what Dave said earlier, you know, substitute something in. You know, if you, we have an ordinance that says, okay, you know, these people are protected by the ADA as a disability. That's clear, there's no question about that. That's, that's law, okay? You wanna substitute, substitute race. Let's do an ordinance that prohibits people in recovery from opening up houses and renting them out to people in recovery. Let's let's put an ordinance that says that. Well, then you might as well substitute race. Let's do an ordinance that says, okay, we're only gonna, we're not going to allow you to rent to a certain race in your neighborhood. I mean, it has the same effect on a federal law. It has a different meaning in our minds, but in essence, on a legal standing, it's it's the same. And that's what we've been challenged with. I mean, it's hard it's hard to regulate. And we're gonna again. I don't have a problem yeah. regulating um, a recovery house, a silver house, whatever we call it. Uh, I have no issue with that, but I want to do it without putting us in a jackpot where the city's going to be spending a half million dollars, you know, and then we're funding, then we're funding these people to go buy six houses somewhere in Florida. Yes, Which I think it's like the whole point here is that these people did not have to come and say anything. So anybody who has a property, can not to anybody, they don't have to say anything. So we can put whatever laws we want, it still doesn't matter. Because you, there's nothing to stop anybody who has a house to let somebody live there. In the back. Yeah. Um, they said that they're going to be required to go to meetings and um, to go to work. Who's policing whether they go to the room meetings to go to work? Now, bar is no. I mean, my understanding, and that was questions I, that was questions I had to. I mean, that was my understanding. I mean, the house manager is going to be responsible for doing a lot of stuff. But, I mean, I don't know what John shared. I mean, he shared with with me. He, after in, in his addiction, he spent time in in a, a sober house, and he's and, and I asked him that. Okay, with your experience, some people are breaking the rules. What happens? He goes. It's really hard if you're living up to the house rules, or if you're 
trying to use again. It's really hard to live in that house with three other guys that are trying to be sober because they will run you out of there so much quicker than a landlord will. And, you know, I haven't, I, I kind of believe that. Um, you know, I don't have experience with it, but if, if you've got, unless they're not screening their people at all and they're bringing in guys dealing drugs, guys that are serious about recovery, you heard the Ryan stand up here and talk. Uh, Ryan was scared to death to speak. Let me, I'm not talking. I'm saying so. Ryan was scared to death to talk. I don't believe that if Ryan knew his roommate was dealing drugs, that he'd be quiet about it. When he was trying, it looks like he fought hard to get that that sobriety. So I, I don't know. Again, this is this is a gray area we don't know about. You know, it could be it could be a nightmare, uh, or it could be one of the best success stories we've ever seen, or somewhere in between. I have no idea. It seems like the genie's out of the bottle now, and this place is going to go in and have its roots in the acres, no matter what. You talked about in Aurora that they did shut them down. Was that based on the city's part that they didn't fulfill out of? It couldn't have been just mowing the lawn because okay, I'll mow the lawn and now I'm okay. Did I mean? I don't know what what Dave there. I I don't know if he could answer it. I don't mean it to be a trick question, but what would it take? to shut them down, I mean, how deep would the offense have to be or how long would it would have to it would be? Have to be it would have to be a nuisance, which is you have to keep the pattern of a persistent problem ongoing. And, and my understanding of what happened in Aurora is they weren't aware of the number of people in there when they started pushing back and the city started pushing hard on, on nuisance issue, issues and noise issues and everything else. They ended up finding another house in Akron and they left. I mean, that's, they didn't get them out of there because they were a sober house. They, they pushed on existing ordinances that were on the books regarding nuisance and noise and parking and things like that, which we've talked about that we're going to stay on top of. Part two of that question then, does, does that property, can that property, since it's fair housing now, can that be opened up by somebody else who is in business to do this? Grab that property and do it again. Every the, every house is it can subject to fair housing. Every single house. Okay. It can yeah. happen anywhere. Yeah. So anywhere I mean, so I mean, it, 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 just because it is right now doesn't mean it be permanent. It always was. Your house is subject to fair housing. Every okay. house. You can't pick and choose who you sell your house to. You can't right. deny somebody that's protected. All right. I think we covered a lot tonight. Thank you for your time, too. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Not, not a problem. And, and again, I, the door is wide open. You want to come in and talk? I mean, you know, where's Mike? Mike left. Mike, Mike, Mike shows up all the time. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you.